There I am. Sorry for the slight technical delay there in the start, uh, but uh, there was a little bit of rewording that had to be done because um, I've got not one, but two co-hosts tonight on this episode nine of Chew the Fat, where we pick a topic to talk about. And in tonight's case, it is the films of the late great, and I will say great because I think he was great, actor Burt Reynolds, very much an actor that was kind of in my childhood. Um, and we'll, we'll get into all of that. Uh, but let me bring my first guest. It's none other than the man who wrote this book and sent me a signed copy. Uh, he's coming in all the way from his island estate. Wayne Byrne, thank you very much, sir, for coming on again. Really appreciate you. Hey, Lance. Thanks for having me again. And then we've got a surprise guest who um, uh, let me know he was coming on about 37 seconds ago. Uh, which is just enough time for me to retype his name into the scrolling title there. Uh, we've got previous first assistant, director, loving father, and um, teacher of talented skaters, David McGifford. Not trying to horn in. I'm just here to listen. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, you're just observing the set, so to speak. Yeah. But you, am I right in thinking you were on a couple of, you were on a couple of Burt Reynolds movies no did you ever meet the man okay you did it all right tell you what you can tell us about that towards the end okay so and david's very keen to see what our choices are but before we get into our top five those people that are that are watching we've done a top five before we did a top five fantasy films uh pre-1990 uh, on the channel before. Uh, I had Matthew Holmes on for that, and I had the uh, Inside Man on for that, who works in the industry as well. And uh, we all voted for our top five, but also the people in chat voted, and we, 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 we scored points accordingly. And on the case of that stream, the first place um, was Jason and the Argonauts, Ray Harryhausen. Second place tied was Conan the Barbarian and Clash of the Titans, Third place, The Princess Bride. Fourth place, Highlander tied with Beastmaster. Um, oh, sorry, a fifth place, Beastmaster and Time Bandits. So there was quite a lot of fantasy films pre-1990. Science fiction films like Star Trek, Wrath of Khan, that kind of thing, were not allowed to take part in that. So in the case of um, uh, today, uh, after we talked about Burt Reynolds' uh, career for a little bit, and I'll hand over to Wayne in a second, uh, we will be each kind of saying what our top five Burt Reynolds films are. I may come to David at the end of the stream about that because he's probably compiling his list um, as we speak. Um, I had to get down to a short list of about 15 movies, which was actually harder than I thought it would be, and then go to five from there. And getting the order of those five was really difficult. Um, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll get on to that when we, when we start the list about what my – criteria were for my top five Burt Reynolds movies. So Wayne, why did you do a biography uh, book about the late great King of Moustaches, Burt Reynolds? What was, uh, you know, and what was the first Burt Reynolds movie that you saw that probably led to this decision happening in your later life? Okay. Well, the reason I ended up choosing Burt to be my, the subject of my second book was because I had published my first book, which was on my favorite filmmaker, Tom DeChillo. And I had never intended to be a professional writer or anything like that. I just, I thought to myself, if the only book I ever got to release was a book on Tom DeChillo, I would be immensely happy with that because all I wanted was a book on Tom DeChillo on my shelf. But throughout this five-year process of working on the Tom DeChillo book, I discovered that I really loved this writing thing. And when the book came out and I wasn't writing anymore, I felt, Jesus, I need to be writing again. So I thought, okay, well, I've done my favorite director. How about now I do my favorite actor? And I have a very short list of favorite actors. I tend to be interested more by directors, screenwriters, cinematographers, people like that more so than actors. But my short list of favorite actors would probably be the likes of John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, Burt Reynolds, Steve Buscemi. So I thought, okay, I've done my favorite director. Now, how about I do my favorite actor for the next one? So I talked to the publisher of the Tom DeChilla book about that because it was part of my contract that I had to 
offered them whatever my next book was going to be. And I kind of suspected they were going to turn it down because they deal more in directors rather than actors. And even though Bert has ha has directed movies, it's a quite a, a short number of them. And they wouldn't exactly be considered, you know, masterpieces of world cinema, which is kind of what Columbia University Press goes for. So I kind of had an idea of another publisher who I thought might be ideal. And they loved the idea. They said, Wayne, uh, Burt Reynolds is not just a huge movie star where we're based. He is a hero. You know, he's an icon. So they're based in North Carolina. So, you know, that's a big constituency of Burt Reynolds. You know, a lot of his fan base is down there. And they said... Yeah, he had a second home there, didn't he? I think so. He's been down there, you yeah. know, over the years. So, yeah. So the, it kind of dawned on me then, it dawned on me then that, oh, shit, you know, these guys are interested. Now I have to deliver a comprehensive book on Burke Reynolds, and that's a huge undertaking because he had a massive career incorporating over 120 movies, multiple TV shows, which have multiple seasons in and of themselves. So, And I gave myself a year. So if you can imagine my first book took five years to write about eight movies. My second book took one year to write about 120 plus movies. So all of a sudden I'm, I'm in, you know, mm. and a, a big problem here was, as we were mentioning earlier on, it was very hard to get a lot of those movies because not all of them were, you know, have now they have received deluxe edition, Blu-rays and whatever. But when I was doing the book, a lot of them were still unavailable. So I had to track down VHS tapes or bootlegs or I had to go to the Warner Archive or the MGM Archive and request, you know, the on-demand copies. So it was a bit of a bit of a research project in and of itself just to track down all of the movies. And a lot of his later work weren't big releases either. So a lot of them are maybe straight to video or straight to DVD. But I mean, I loved him enough and I loved enough of his movies to know I wanted to devote myself to writing about his career but the big thing for me was there were plenty of books already about Burt Reynolds out there but the focus on those were his personal life you know uh, kind of they were more sensational more tabloidy I guess you could call them Burt himself had two very good very enjoyable autobiographies which covered again more of his personal life and a little bit of the films but I kind of wanted to write that wrong in that I thought of him as a not only a great movie star but a great American icon a great filmmaker as a great director, but also a great writer. And, you know, I think there's a lot about Burst that people didn't realize, you know, about his career, that he had done a lot of the TV TV stuff. He had gone to New York and done the theater thing before he was a huge Hollywood movie star. And I just felt he was one of the few movie stars that I felt some kind of affinity to in terms of the themes of his work. You know, there's something about Burst that makes him really identifiable. And whether that's in his kind of more hard-edged roles or his comedy roles or his romantic roles. There's just something about him. He's extremely unpretentious. And for somebody of his caliber, of his stature, that's very rare. And he just always intrigued me ever since the first time I saw, when I think of it now, you know, it's like when I think of Elm Street, you know, I think I was like four or five years old when I first saw those movies. I was, I was four or five, maybe six when I first saw Deliverance. So as you can imagine, that's a powerful God, thing to see when you're what a, what a movie to watch when you're five years old. Um, I'm, I've got some stuff to say about Deliverance. Um, damn, that's that's so, nuts. So all those elements combined made me want to write about Bert. And I was lucky that McFarland, the publisher, were very interested. And it was great. You know, it was just a wonderful year, an intense year because, you know, Bert passed away towards the end of the book. So, you know, you're, you're heavily invested in the subject the person you're writing mm. about and you feel some kind of closeness, even if you've, you haven't met them or spent time with them. Cause Bert, Bert has always been, Bert's work has always been a part of my life. And then to be spending every waking moment writing about him was a whole other intensity, you know, but um, thanks to uh, Nick McLean, you know, who really introduced me to some wonderful people that you know, got to speak to some of Bert's colleagues got to become good friends with them. And Nick was first on my list of people I wanted to talk to because I, I knew Nick's work, his work with Bert and also his huge, huge career outside of his work, work with Bert. But I thought, okay, if there's someone I really want to talk to here, it's Nick McLean because he's directed with Bert and he did a BL striker with him. And he shot a lot of his movies as he was either cinematographer or camera operator. So he was someone I really wanted to connect with. And Nick was instrumental in opening up doors for me as well, because Bert's approaching people about a Bert book was difficult because straight away people closed up. 
Mm. Okay, they didn't. People are naturally suspicious of why you want to write about Burke Reynolds. It's like, oh, another book about his personal life, you know, marriages. Yeah, or this yeah, or that yeah, 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 yeah. And I, it was hard convincing them all the time that you know, no, no, it's about the work. But they don't know me from Adam. So, but to have Nick McLean in my corner and say, this guy's good. You should talk to him, you know, and one by one, you know, they see after an interview or two what I'm what I'm all about, which was the art, which was the work, etc. So I managed to get some people thanks to Nick. So I really have to credit Nick with this book as well. Well, uh, and for anyone in chat who doesn't know who uh, Nick McLean is, and we are still trying to get him on for an interview, which I'm hoping David McGifford will uh, kidnap him, take him to his house. And we'll do the interview there where the technicals uh, seem to be working a lot better. But we did try and do an interview with uh, David McLean before. He is a director of photography. Uh, he's worked with Bert, I think, on about 10 occasions at least, including on the Cannonball Run uh, films. Uh, he's also the DOP on the Goonies and a num number of other iconic uh, movies. But he does live in an area with very poor internet reception. Um, so it doesn't matter how great a DOP you are. Sometimes you just can't get good internet um but um hopefully we'll rearrange that interview and we will get um david mclean um on uh, i just want to say hello to a few people in the chat we've got a few uh regulars in someone called david mcgiffer oh he's already here that's all we don't, don't need to mention him uh brogu and keith are both regulars of mine thanks guys uh for coming in um so um uh, it's nice to see you guys here. Uh, David Macy, who's one of my mods, is here. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, good to good to see you. Guys, if you have any questions for Wayne or indeed David, although keep it Burt Reynolds focused because I don't want to go down too many rabbit holes because believe me, me and David definitely could do that. There's someone called Gator McCluskey in the stream. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Uh, that name seems very familiar to me. Uh, as Keith e says, I wonder what number one Gators film is. Yeah, that's uh, and uh, David is saying one of the last from the golden age of Hollywood. I, I have to agree, I think probably I'd be hard pushed to think of, of that era who is left apart from Clint Eastwood. Maybe is there anyone else? It was Clint Eastwood and Sean Connery for a while. Connery's gone, so I, I can't yeah. think of I think anyone as a certain Not kind of star. Certainly, Clint Eastwood is. The last, yeah. you know, of course, he's, Mike, we still have Mike, Michael you know, Douglas came later than than to the to the movies. He came to the movies in the eighties. Eastwood yeah. was still from the seventies. I can't think of anyone else. Well, we still have De Niro and Pacino around, but again, I think we're talking about a certain kind yeah. of uh, a certain kind of Hollywood star, and I think Clint is the only one left who could rival Bert in those terms. Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably true. Um, all right, well, look, let's um. Let's get on to the to the movies and to reiterate what David said. His book is really it's a kind of an encyclopedia almost of of the feature films and to a lesser degree some other elements of his career um, from start to finish about the films, what they're about, uh, how they did, um, uh, the roles that Bert played, and then there's also a couple of interviews uh, in the book as well from people who worked with him, including one from. Uh, McLean and was it Rachel Ward who was on yep, from what? Jackie's Machine? Yeah, um, uh, and I I went over that one again today, and uh, we'll see why later. Uh -huh. So um, I'm going to talk about <laughs> I'm going to say something controversial that's probably going to make people in chat completely lose their shit, but I'm going to talk about some films um, of mine that didn't meet. That were there were ones that I considered, but they didn't get in the top five. They're all films I love that Burt Reynolds is in. Now, in the end, uh, I decided that one of the things that was really important to me was: would I want to rewatch this film now, or show it to my new partner, who, by the way, doesn't know who Burt Reynolds is? Um, there might be a bit of an age gap there. David knows what I'm talking about. So, um, uh. Uh, and um, uh, the second thing is, um, uh, is it a film I want to own? Um, and then and then also just how good a movie is it in terms of script, other cast, everybody else? How good is Bert in it? Uh, so I kind of picked them on that basis. And I, I know, Wayne, you, you were like 
in terms of what they meant to you when you you saw them that's a key factor for me as well because i went and revisited many of them this this week that i hadn't watched since the 80s actually and in most cases i was i was i was glad that i did but one of the ones that didn't make it in my top five was deliverance um now if my list was which is the most sort of gripping creepy artistic you know what's the oppenheimer of the burt reynolds list deliverance would definitely be it but that was not my criteria and um i saw deliverance once when i was really young didn't understand what i was seeing i watched it once again when i was an adult and i didn't want to see it again that doesn't mean that i think it was a bad film I think it was a very good film, but it didn't make it in my top five because it's not a film I want to watch again. Uh, it is a very good film. It was definitely in the short list and it was kind of hanging around at the number five spot for a while. But in the end, um, that didn't make it in my top five for that reason. Don't tell me if it's in yours or not, because we want to keep all of that a surprise. Um, other things that were near misses for me were Boogie Nights, which... I think it's a brilliant film, but Burt Reynolds is not the star of that movie. He's a supporting character and a very good one. The star of the movie is is Mark Wahlberg, and it's ultimately, um, uh, you know, it's it's not ultimately a, a Burt Reynolds movie per se. So, um, <laughs> Gate McCluskey is getting very upset. I told you it's going to cause cause a stir in the chat. He's getting upset with me already. Um, other ones that were on the list um, were Gator. Uh, so Gator McCluskey is going to be very upset. That was on my short list. That, again, was number four or five for quite a while. Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. I really wanted on the top five, but it just didn't quite make it. Um, uh, I also had Switching Channels would have been in my top ten because I actually really like that movie. Uh, but so th those are some of the ones. City Heat was another one. Those are some of the ones that didn't make it in my top five. I'll explain what my top five are as we go through the, the categories. And Gator's very upset. Uh, I would say that Gator and Deliverance would probably be my number six and number seven in my top ten. Um, and then maybe Best Little Whorehouse. But uh, before you judge, Gator, wait and see what my, what my top five are. Yeah, uh, Switching Channels is not a brilliant movie, but it meant a lot to me at the time. So. Um, Gators not so uh, it's, as we can see the only justification for not including Deliverance would be it's not a Burt Reynolds film it's his best film it's a masterpiece I agree it's a masterpiece it's just not a film I want to see again um, so uh, but I think it's brilliant I don't disagree with you you're completely correct and if it was somebody's number one I think that would be a perfectly logical choice uh, Wayne did, are any of the ones that I mentioned in your near miss list Deliverance would be in my near miss list. Oh, uh, again, I, I totally agree with Gator. It's an absolute masterpiece, but the reasons I consider it a masterpiece are many fold and not just, you know, in the context of Burke Reynolds. I think it is one of the great films of the new Hollywood, and there's a lot of great social or socio political themes going on there within it. Yeah. But um, it just, when it came, when I was making this list, you know, it's been a while since I watched a lot of these films because when you spend a year watching this many films, you know, you kind of, when you finish it, you tend to move on to the next thing. So I had to kind of think about them really in terms of the ones that have always lingered as personal mm. favorites. And yes, if I was to review judge deliverance in and of itself, easily five out of five, 10 out of 10 movie, it's a masterpiece, but yeah. my list is more on the personal level films that mean something to me. So uh, again, they yeah. cause consternation among the, that's a that's a big that's a big factor for me as well um there's the director in me that's judging it on the mm. kind of the artistic merits but there's the child in me who's judging it on kind of what it meant to me then and and, and how much of that still remains and in, and in the case of all of the, my choices how mm. i felt about it as a kid is how i feel about the film now with yeah. the exception of one, which is is more mm. recent. And let me just I, say, I would have switching channels way higher up the list than Boogie Nights. <laughs> oh, it would be, yeah, probably be, it might have been like number 12 for me in a top 20 or so. I did like it, though. It was one of his later films that was, I thought, was fairly decent. Um, uh, 
So Ben Shockley is in the uh, chat, who incidentally is a very talented actor. Nice to have you on hey, the ben. channel, Ben. Good to see you. Uh, David, did you have anything to add before we jump into top five? No? You're just going to hang there and look cool in your artistic house. Okay, good. So, um, uh, all right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it in a bit. All right, so we're going to get on to our number five then. Um, oh, but before we do that, I will just show everybody a couple of things. Now, I had these out because originally they were in my top five list, but then when I started putting things like which one comes higher than the other, they gradually both got bumped out. But here are the vinyl soundtracks for City Heat. I have that. Yeah, so I bought that when it came out. I really liked it. Um, the music um, is by... Uh, I forget who did the score for this. Because it's it's an instrumental... Uh, Irene Cara sings a couple of songs in it, and there's a couple of throwback songs to the 20 eras. It's uh, by Lenny Niehaus, who's not a... Oh, Burke. yeah, he did a couple of Burke movies in the 80s. Or yeah. uh, Clint movies, sorry. And then I have... The best little whorehouse in Texas vinyl, um, as well. So, uh, excellent. excellent, which is good. So David's got the double album version of that, of course. Um, so I'm just throwing that in there to check he's still listening, right? Okay, so we're on to our number five, we're on to our number five choice then. Uh, and I've even got a little thing I can put up for that. So, um, okay, our number five, okay, so. Those people watching in the chat, you can write down your own list of top five Burt Reynolds movies. The only qualification really is that because you aren't your criteria or your own uh, is that he has to be in it. Um, now I have my board here and I'm going to write down the choices in chat. So if you're watching um, and you've got your number five choice and you want to take part, um, then uh, give us your number five choices while I'm discussing this with Wayne. So, uh, and while David is um, hanging mysteriously, uh, waiting to pounce upon us at a key moment. Uh, Wayne, what's your number five pick? White Lightning. Which is the first Gator film. Yeah. And I love Gator. In fact, if you were to ask me which one to watch now, I'd probably pick Gator, but I think White Lightning again means more to me. Just it was one of the early Burt movies that I saw. And over the years, it's kind of it's kind of a very haunting, serious kind of movie. I mean, it's the flip side of, you know, Smokey and the Bandit and Cannonball Run and that. It's very dark and moody. And, you know, it opens with that horrible scene of the, the two college kids tied in a rowboat and the rowboat yeah. is shot and they go down and it's, it's, God, it's horrible. Ned Beatty, you know, this big sweaty ogre sheriff yeah it's just absolutely fantastic and it's just this sweltering simmering southern setting which really adds to the atmosphere and bert is quite serious in the movie now he has his moments of high action of course but it's nothing compared to the the heightened violence of gator which is you know very stylized and very over the top and very you know i think william fraker great cinematographer shot it and it's very it's pristine in his manner but I think um, White Lightning has a ruggedness about it, you know, directed by the great Joseph Sargent that just has kept me going back to it over the years. And it's the kind of, in, it's the tough guy, Bert, I like, which is kind of mean and moody and serious. And, you know, you have the great Bo Hopkins in there as well. So it's just a great Southern thriller, you know, and of which there were many in the 70s, but they were kind of derivative of this, I think. And of course, Thunder Road with Robert Mitchum, which is the kind of the starter of all that. But I yeah. think uh, White Lightning is just the pinnacle of that kind of movie. And for me, it has to be top five. We've got several people taking part in the chat. We've got one vote for The Longest Yard, one for Hooper, one for Cannonball Run, one for Deliverance at spot number five. Uh, David I, Macy, I don't know what that is. Don't use an abbreviation. Just write it out. Is, is, that, is that Best Little Whorehouse in Texas? Oh, okay. That's what that is. All right. Okay. Best in Texas. I'll give you that. So, um, wow. So everybody's voted for a different film almost. Yeah. I saw White Lightning in the cinema, not when it was released. I think it was a double bill with something called Dixie Dynamite. Do you, does anybody remember that film? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, 
although that might have double billed with the the alligator movie i forget um but uh, but uh, uh yeah it was double billed with something it was a re-release that this would have been late um 70s and then gator was gator is the opens with the scene in the swamp with all the the cops in the canoes waiting to try and catch him and there's that amazing elaborate boat sequence and it may be that that might be on someone's list and we'll come back to it but um it's like a james bond movie at one point it it is i mean it, it's probably the more rewatchable of the films as, as as you said um but uh yeah white lightning okay interesting uh choice to uh star um who was the key co-star in that movie uh well you had ned Beatty was the, the villain and bo hopkins and oh god matt can't remember a second name matt, jennifer billingsley was would have been the love interest that's right um just getting a picture up for us to have a, a quick look at um and yeah, the poster for this, I'd actually looked at it earlier today. And to be fair, I haven't seen it since I think I've only seen the movie once um, since I saw it the first time. Uh, but that's but the, the poster promises a lot more of an action packed movie than I think it is. It's definitely a darker, <laughs> kind of thing. But yeah, it might be more like a uh... poster for Gator. <laughs> There's there's a lot of movies that are there's a lot of movies that are guilty uh, with with posters that are guilty of that crime, um, yeah. for 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 sure. Um, uh, our friend Gator McCluskey in the chat, uh, who clearly is a Burt Reynolds fan with a name like that, but has enormous charm in White Nightling, but it's not a well directed film. Gator was a much better film with Burt Shining as a director. I think Gator was that his first movie as a director, Gator. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, um, Jerry Reed. I like Jerry Reed. We lost him sadly not that that long ago. Okay, all right. Well, that's White Lightning. Is uh, so we've got White Lightning, Hooper, The Longest Yard, Cannibal Run, Deliverance, Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. Those all came from the chat. Um, so Darth Plato, you've just joined us. We're just doing our top five Burt Reynolds films. If you want to take part, mate. Um, vote for your number five now and put it in the chat, please. Um, so uh, my choice is, let me get the uh, poster up because I, I spent ages getting all the posters and putting them in one folder today. So uh, uh, it's a lot of work, this, uh, this uh, YouTube business. There it is. This is an original UK cinema quad in fact uh which goes for quite a few bob as i discovered on the ebay uh ad that i got the image from so my number five choice is sharky's machine um i re-watched this today remember thinking it was quite good uh when i saw it this i would have seen on uh rental I believe it was a Warner Brothers release in one of those big clamshell VHS boxes. And it had kind of a portrait version of this poster. And I just had a recollection that it was one of my um, stronger um, choices uh, of, of seeing sort of an early Burt Reynolds movie. But I had to rewatch it to be sure. It's not aged brilliantly um but it's um there's a lot about it that i really like i really like the supporting cast um which is includes um the likes of uh henry silver who kind of played bad guy of the week in a lot of 70s and 80s movies brian keith and charles durning who both did a lot of other films with uh reynolds um durning was in um, Whole House in Texas, of course. Bernie Casey from Revenge of the Nerds is in the film. And the machine refers to the squad that kind of um, Reynolds' character puts together um, to fight the corruption. And it was based on a book. And I think I read about this in your book, Wayne, that, that um, Burt Reynolds uh, was given the book by Clint Eastwood in a, in a return favour because... Um, Bert gave Clint the book for Escape from Alcatraz. Is that right? No, um, he had given him the book for The Outlaw Josie Wales. Ah, so, that was it. Sorry, so, yeah. So, so in return, 
Clint gave him a copy of William Deal's book, Sharky's Machine. So, yeah. which is is quite a different uh, book from the from the finished film. But um, I think I'll, I'll reserve judgment until later on. But it's higher in my list. Let's just say. Well, okay, so we're going to be talking about it again. I mean, I'll mention a couple of other things that I like. I really like the opening shot which is um, these days would have been a drone, but it's one long helicopter shot, which finally comes to rest on. Um, well, you know who did that, don't you? Uh, that would have been um, Hal Needham, I'm, I'm suspecting. Or was it? Or well, was it... well, no, that's uh, Mr. Nick McLean. In that it helicopter. was Nick McLean, right. Okay, yep. yeah. Um, that that does not surprise me. Um, yeah, great shot. Um, it was... Um, you know, uh, it was Atlanta as it was then. It looks nothing like um, Atlanta now. And, um, yeah, it was known as kind of Dirty Harry in Atlanta. That's I think that's a fair um, comparison. And um, don't put your number four votes, guys, in the chat until we get on to number four, please, because you may change your mind as well. So don't put them in the chat yet. Wait, wait until we move on to number four. Um, but, yeah, I really liked it. Um, I thought... Um, the actress, I think it was her first kind of major gig, Rachel Ward. I think thought she did pretty well. I thought she was pretty good. Um, yeah, she had done a couple got... of horror movies just before this, kind of low budget ones. One of them was with Andrew Davis, The Final yeah. Terror. This was her first major movie, and you know we spoke a lot about that. So she had huge, huge fondness for Bert and this movie. Yeah, your interview with her in the book is really good, and you you get a real sense of the atmosphere that. Burt liked to have on a Burt Reynolds film and he would really look after people. And not only that, he would look after people, you know, if he, if you became friends with him, yeah. there was a story about him putting proper air conditioning in her flat in LA and, and doing things like that for her that she couldn't afford. And yeah. I, I think that says a lot about him. Um, they worked together again many years later on a TV movie, a, a very good Western TV movie called Johnson County war. And I think it was early 2000s. But, yeah, they reconnected there. So, you know, they had a great respect for each other. Yeah, and I I, I, um, I, I liked uh, the music. Um, it, it had a very almost Rocky-esque style in terms of that. And I'm talking about the first movie in terms of the grit and the uh, and, and the grain of the, of the environment and the use of songs. There, there were some things that haven't aged well. And I'm talking about the kind of salacious, sexist humour, but that's also part of the film's charm because of when it was set. Um, maybe charm is not the right word, but um, but I still thought it, it, it had a it had a lot about it that was that for me made it a really superior Burt but effort, and also the fact that he directed it, um, and I could see what he was trying to do. And, and even with the shot shots, the way that he told the story, he was trying to make it very different from um, other films that he'd been in. And I, I really liked that. So I watched it with a completely different set of goggles on when I saw it today, because I actually, I think when I watched it before, I didn't appreciate that he directed it. Um, yeah. So for me, it's uh, number five. Um okay. I don't know if David has a number five choice. He's kind of on sabbatical until he has something useful to say, he's telling me. But if David has a number five choice, he can tell us now. He can tell us his choices at the end. Um, so that's Sharky's machine. Okay. Um, so I think we'll move on to um, film number four then. Which means chat. You can now put your number four choices in. Don't don't put it in before we we move on to the number. So we've got one. We've got one vote for Sharky's Machine from um, Gator McCluskey. So it's also on uh, his list. Uh, David uh, has a four as well. Yeah, and we've got one from. Uh, we've got another one for Sharky's Machine from Brogu. Um, Sharky's Machine for for me as well. So that's a. Uh, for Darth Plato, or oh, I think that might have been his number five, actually. Um, so, and then uh, um, Hooper, we've got Hooper at number four from somebody from David. Was that from David Macy? Yeah, and then uh, another one for Sharky. Okay, oh, that was Gate Plusky. I got that already. 
Um, ben Shockley is saying mean machine. He means the the longest yard. Okay. So what's your what's your number four, Wayne? David David's going for longest yard as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, so okay. David McGiffer is saying longest yard for number five or number four. Hang on, Dave. Number four. But David, what's your number five choice? I didn't have one. Oh, okay. Well, you can you can add one later. All right. Well, I, I want to just make sure it's a film I actually know about. I don't want to just say something. No, no, no. That's okay. It. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. So longest yard for you as well. All right. Cool. <laughs> that's good. Okay. David's being a man of mystery today. To see him less mysterious, watch the David McGifford interview on the channel. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, Wayne. So what's your choice? Number four. Malone. Malone. That isn't yep. that one of the that's one of the bad wig piece movies. <laughs> yeah, but it's a great movie though. Bad wig, great movie. But no, again, coming back to you know things I, I rented as a kid <laughs> that kind of inspired my my love of Burt. This is one of them. I mean, it's it kind of reminds me of Clint Eastwood's Pale Rider. It's basically Shane just updated to the nineteen eighties, you know, and take out Brandon the Wilds little Joey and put in you know the can't remember the actress's name, but you know it's it's basically Bert coming into town to save the homesteaders from the evil businessmen kind of thing, you know, and it works perfectly on a B-movie action thriller level. You know, again, unpretentious, probably about 87 minutes long, no no fat, just purely in action, and it's great. And I think Bert is, is very good in it. You can see this was a period where he wasn't too well. I guess it was coming after the accident on City Heat where his whole jaw was busted after... Uh, getting hit with a, a real chair in a stunt. Mm. So he looks remarkably thinner, you know, um, but he's, he still looks great on screen. He fills the screen, you know, he's still as handsome, charming self and the mustache is as beautiful as ever. But um, just as a entertaining action movie, it's up there. I mean, it's um, my other choices are probably, there's something a bit more going on in them in terms of teams and ideas and stuff like that. But I think Malone is just my favorite out and out Burt action movie. Um, I think Gage disagrees because he's just said he's just um, he's just burned your book. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beauty of writing books. I have no boss to tell me otherwise. <laughs> and I, I did hear David laughing at your choice. I don't know what that meant. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I grabbed that image because I remember that image, but with a flaming background behind it was the cover for the poster in the UK uh, for the That's BHS. Great. Yeah. Went straight to VHS on in the UK. I have a vague recollection that me and a friend of mine rented it out. And I, I seem to recall that, that that our main comments were about, God, that wig looks awful. And that's really all I can remember about the film. Now, maybe I need to rewatch it and I, I will reassess it without focusing on the wig. I am um, not claiming it to be a masterpiece. I am just saying. No, 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 no. If, yeah. if you come over to my house for a few beers, likelihood I'll put it on is high. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a pizza and beers movie. Um, so Ben Shockley had it on VHS once. He's just said in the chat. Yeah, I, enjoyed right. it many, I, I still have the VHS actually from the eighties. I've worn a tin. Well, that's um, that's Wayne's choice. David's choice number four is the longest yard. I won't get into the longest yard now because we're going to come back to that one. Um, my number four choice is one of Bert's last films. Um, and I have to say, I think it's one of his best. Um, and I could have actually even put this at number one, but, um, and I thought about that, but I thought, no, it's not the ultimate Burt Reynolds movie. Um, but it is the ultimate send off. Um, for Bert, and that is the last movie star. Now, for anyone who hasn't seen it, Bert played to wa plays a washed up movie star called Vic Edwards, who um, drank too much, went through a number of failed relationships and business opportunities, and uh, is invited by his long suffering agent, who's played by Chevy Chase, to attend a very small. Um, film convention in honor of his movies celebrating his old movies and all of the movies are they've got posters for them all at the convention and they're all homages to 
Burt's actual movies like Smoking the Bandit and Sharky's Machine and so on. And a very old, frail Burt attends, um, tries to do a runner from the convention, finds his accommodations are actually um, right next to a freeway and it's a, a terrible hotel. Um, but um, one of the things I really like about it is they, using the wonders of modern technology, they insert him into scenes from his past movies, in particular Smokey and the Bandit, and they edit the Burt Reynolds of now talking to the younger version of himself and the younger version is kind of almost telling the older version off um and i loved that um really kind of weird pathos in the film and that the whole film is very personal to Bert. and he did say that if he got the script any earlier in life he wouldn't have been able to do it um because it was too close to the bone I think it's brilliant. And I remember when I saw it, I thought, God, this is probably going to be his last film. And I'm not sure if it's the last one he shot, but it's the last of three that came out in the same year. And then he passed away um, the following year. I think his performance in it is amazing. I don't know why he didn't get nominated for an Oscar for that performance. Um, I think it's criminal that he wasn't. And it, in my opinion, I, th I think he should have got it. Um, so... Um, I agree. I think yeah. the film also should have won many awards is Adam Rifkin's yeah. masterpiece and such a poignant piece of work because everything is, it's all allusions to Burt's career. I mean, it's autobiographical without actually saying it's autobiographical, you know? Um, yeah, it could easily have made my top five. Um, I've watched it many times since it's come out and it came out, you know, I saw it when I was writing the book, it was fairly new at that point. And I spoke to Adam Rifkin about it, and he, you know, like myself, like yourself or whoever, you know, growing up a huge Burt Reynolds fan, he just wanted to pay tribute to this star that he saw as being so unique in the canon of American cinema, but yet who hadn't really gotten his dues. I mean, when you look at Clint Eastwood and John Wayne, other big stars like that I've, who I've mentioned, they've gotten their awards, they've gotten their Oscars, they've gotten the critical plaudits, but Burt never really did, you know, and I think... Um, That's yeah. Adam... Rifkin with on the set, isn't it? That was a great um, photo that Adam sent to me for the book. And yeah, yeah, he loved he loved the book, you know, which was great for to hear that from him. You know, it was fantastic. But uh, yeah, an outstanding film and gets one emotional every time you watch it. You know, it's just he got it right. Yeah, I've seen it twice, and both I have to admit, and I am a bit of a big softy, but um, both times um, I cried. I really did. Um, uh, Gator is saying, just kidding, Wayne, your book is excellent. Um, thank you, man. Obviously, obviously, if you burn it, Wayne can't sign it, just remember that. So, <laughs> um, that's very important, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a great movie. Um, again, get falling back to my criteria that I cited for these choices at the beginning, the supporting cast are also very good, the two kids. Um, who are kind of running the convention are a brother and sister who are sort of big nerds about his films while well, the brother is, but the sister is kind of doesn't really know who he is. She's, she's sort of reluctantly dragged on and, and her and Vic slash Bert go off and have their own little adventure. And I, I, it's almost like a side quest within the movie, but it really works. And um, I like the ending um, as well. Um, yeah, it's a great film. Um not much more to say about that, really. If you haven't seen it, anyone in chat, I, I, I mean, it, it is one of his greatest performances. It's definitely, he's definitely on par with Boogie Nights and it's one of his last. And, and you know, if Burt meant anything to you in your childhood, you ain't going to not cry when you watch that film, I'll tell you now. Um, okay. Uh, we had a number four choice from David McGifford. Uh, anybody else in chat, if you want to vote for your number four choice of Burt Reynolds movies, your top five, uh, put it in chat now. Uh, but we are going to move on to our number three. And remember, if you write a choice in the chat, prefix it with the number three, please. OK, so um, number three, what do you have, Wayne? Robert Aldrich's masterpiece, Hustle. Hustle, right. Yeah. 
no, which I would absolutely. consider one of the best films of the 70s, apart from one of Burt Reynolds' best films. It's just, it's part of that great neo-noir revival that came about in the new Hollywood. And, you know, you had the likes of Chinatown and The Long Goodbye and Hickey and Boggs and all these other movies, which were really paying homage to the great film noir traditions, but doing in this kind of semi-social realist kind of way of the 70s. And Hustle, you know, because it's Robert Aldrich, who comes from the Golden Age era, brought this kind of wonderful eye for Los Angeles, both the glamour side and the underbelly, which Bert's character, you know, traverses quite a bit in the film because it's a film about um, some dark material. You know, a, a woman, a young woman is found on the beach. She turns out to be the daughter of a retired Korean war veteran who is kind of, you know, settled down into a nice middle-class suburbia and his, world is rocked when he finds out that his daughter was involved in prostitution and that prostitution ring leads all the way up to you know corridors of power so it's a great film about corruption both of power and youth and Bert is just wonderful in it. he's very serious in it it's a uh, one of his straight roles if you want to put it like that mm. you know he just there's very little of his kind of jocular humor that he he's known for so him and Catherine Deneuve make a wonderfully beautiful couple. And, you know, she is one of the great moral quandaries of the film is that she's part of the underworld. She's the link to the underworld. And Bert is obviously a law enforcer. So there's kind of uh, some moral implications for him being in love with Catherine Deneuve. And um, Ben Johnson plays the father of the, the daughter. But it's a great exploration of you know, the idea of the middle-class American dream, you know, here's this guy, he went through war, he's found his nice little house in the suburbs in Los Angeles, and now his world starts to fall apart through all this seedy, corrupt nature, and it turns out his wife was, you know, up to no good as well, so it's his, this guy's world falls apart, and Bert is kind of there to at least pick up some of the pieces as you know, occasionally immoral as he is. So he kind of, he goes through a kind of a redemption, you know, in trying to save this man's world, etc. you know, so. But it's just a masterpiece, really, of new Hollywood cinema and one of my favorite Burke movies. It's so stylishly done. Robert Aldrich was one of those great, new, great old Hollywood directors who could jump into any genre. I mean, he also did The Longest Yard, of course, but he did many other films, such as uh, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and Attack and many, many others. So yeah, he's not yeah. a director you could easily pigeonhole, but when he jumped into this kind of film noir mode, he was absolutely spot on. And if, again, a bit contentious or controversial, I think Hustle is far superior to The Long Goodbye. There, I said it. Um, no, that's, that's interesting. Now, it's funny because I feel like I've overlooked this movie because I, 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 if I remember rightly, doesn't Catherine wear that red dress for like half the film? <laughs> she probably does all right i think most of the scenes where she's she's in is she's looking very glamorous and lounging yeah. around sofas and looking you know lovingly at birth but um yeah. we're, we're yeah um and melvin who's uh just arrived said he was stuck on the plane another one of my regular mm. uh people um thanks for joining melvin we're on number three of our top five uh burt reynolds films but if you want to write down your four and five you know what now chat. that you have this poster up, I think this poster does it an injustice in that it, it makes it look as it's as if it's this kind of sexy good time kind of thing. It's not. It's very dark. You know, it's it's on the it's a similar mood and tone to something like Dirty Harry. Hmm. You know, Bert, Bert with the bare chest there, you know, and the I don't know, cavalier look. Not a big I, remem I remember as soon as you said it opens with the the, the, the dead girl on the beach. I, I remember straight away, oh, yeah, no, I saw this. Um, because when you said Hustle, I was thinking, because, of course, there's been that, that more recent film, Hustle, with um, Christian... Oh, American Hustle. Hustle. Yeah, American Hustle, right. Mm. As soon as you said Hustle, I was thinking, was American Hustle a remake of this? And did, did I see a Burt film that was like American Hustle? They could and, never um, remake this today. <laughs> no. Um, so... Um, it, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a, um, one that I didn't think, oh, do I need to rewatch that to check? Because it didn't lodge in my memory. But I definitely did see it. 
I've got some images of it in my head now that I've seen the poster and reminded myself of the cast list. Paul Winfield, of course, would go on to be in the Terminator movie. Um, Eddie Albert was in just about everything from kind of like, you know, 1969 to... Eddie Albert plays this, the, the politician who is just absolute corrupt and he's the connection to the prostitution ring and, yeah. you know, all that, but he's brilliant. And then we've got Ben Johnson and Ernest Borgnine. Um both in there uh, as well. And some people would remember that Ben Johnson was in and also, Red Dawn. Strange connection. When I was talking to Robert England for my Welcome to Elm Street book, he delighted in the fact that he was the first guy to ever kill Burt Reynolds, spoiler alert, on screen. And that was in Hustle. Oh. <laughs> dude, dude, you should have said spoiler alert like way earlier. But okay. So now oh, well, I know what's going to happen when I rewatch the movie. 50 years old, so it's okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, okay, I see we're we're getting some votes in here. So we've got um, Mel Melvin is just putting in his his later votes in. So we've got a few votes come in for people's number three choices, and Melvin's quickly caught up and given us a four and a five. He's given us Cannonball Rum two. Oh, not the first one. I love Cannonball too. Um, yeah, I like the first one better. Um, Sam Whiskey for his uh, mm. number four choice, which is a film that I haven't seen recently. Um, and he's gone with City Heat for number three. I love City um, Heat again for many reasons, but not necessarily as a Burt movie. Yeah, I, the reason it, it was in my top five, the reason I took it off was because it's a Burt and Clint movie rather than a Burt movie. And I, yeah. I thought ultimately for that reason alone. Well, one of the things I love about it is Nick McLean's cinematography, I think is probably, it's probably my favorite work he's ever done. That movie, as you know, is so stylish. It, it's yeah. all the best elements of the 1930s, 40s, 50s gangster film noir movies. Nick is just absolutely at the top of his game there. And I know Clint loved his work. On that, because Clint loves, you know, kind of low key lighting. He doesn't like to, he likes to kind of be in the shadows. And Nick was perfect at that because Nick comes out of, you know, the new Hollywood era, you know, working with Vilmo Sigmund, where he was, they were changing the game of cinematography. And that was their, their thing was, you know, using different moods of lighting, not your typical kind of golden age era over lighting kind of style. And Clint loved that. And what, what, if there's something disappointing about it, it's the promise of, having Clint Eastwood and Burt Reynolds, they're almost too big for one movie. You know what I mean? It's the perfect ideal double pairing. And it, there's something just in terms of the story doesn't quite, and the chemistry, I think as well, doesn't quite live up to what it should be. But aesthetically speaking, I think it's an absolutely superb film in every level. Yeah, a lot of it's set at night and done mm. on the back lot. And they did a great job with lighting all those sets, interiors, exteriors, the whole the whole lot. Um I was very, very um, impressed. Um, so uh, we we're, we're kind of we're on my number three. Um, Mr. McGifford has given us his choice, which is Hooper. Um, so yep, yeah, thanks very much for that. I'm going to discuss that film uh, in a second. Okay. Uh, my number three choice um, is. <laughs> And I'm preparing myself for an outcry and chat again. Is Smokey and the Bandit 2. Not the first one, the second one. Well, um, as somebody who likes Smokey and the Bandit 3, I cannot criticize you. <laughs> and that's the one that Bert's not in. Careful, <laughs> careful, because Gator may burn your book again uh, for, <laughs> for uh, admitting to such. Um, Sacrilege. Uh, Jim G has arrived late. Jim, we're on our number three choice of our top uh, top five, Burt Reynolds. So you can you can start at number three. Uh, okay. Uh, Gator is saying that Lance is drunk. Uh, no, I'm on the H two O, buddy. So uh, <laughs> I have I'm no not, excuse. <laughs> I, I'm uh, I'm this jolly all the time, mate. It's this is the persona I I have for being on the stream. So um. But I'm not the critical drinker, so I, I do drink on the odd stream occasionally, but normally when it's a bit later. So, um, Smokey, oh, that's probably his response to my choice. 
because he said no <laughs> um, to my smoking the band. Look, I'll tell you why I liked it. Um, I like the first film. I think the second. I think the second film is better, um, and I, I, I'm quite willing to argue my my case, Your Honour. Um, my case is is this, and uh, in fact, Wayne highlights this very well um, in his book. Uh, it, it's. I think the script is slightly better overall. There's a slightly better story rather than just a bu bunch of actors in roles where they're having a laugh. Um, which really, for me, is what the first Smokey and the Bandit film is, and it suffers because of that a little bit. And then the second Cannonball Run is really blatantly that, and I think suffers because of that a lot. Um, but the second um, Smokey and the Bandit film is when Sally Field and Burt Reynolds' relationship was kind of coming to an end. They'd had this big affair, of course, and everything. And um, I'm sure it was probably both their intentions that that was the nature of how their relationship was reflected as characters in the script. They'd kind of broken up for very similar reasons that they actually broke up. There was a sense of um, Bert struggle. This was sort of the beginning of the era of him beginning to struggle with his career to some degree. That was reflected in the, the band of character. So I liked all of those things i'm just going to mute david while he eats his big sandwich there we go um i liked all of those things uh, um but i i loved um the massive ending with all the trucks um and that was really 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 well done when there's that line where he goes tell me how many trucks you can see and they go one and then like suddenly another one peels out and another one peels out and another one peels out i don't know if that was mclean again that that, that shot it no he um, wasn't done it but it was that that for me was um really good i mean gators saying that the first one was brilliant because there was no script the second one was awful with few funny scenes you see i found the reverse i found that the, the second one was the funnier film for me because they they reined that in a bit and there was a good juxtaposition between the comedy and the drama but you know we might be a different age and we might have seen them under different circumstances and i have a feeling also i saw the second one first I think I saw the second one first and then I saw the first one. So that also probably impacted my opinion. In fact, I'm, it must have done. Um, well, one of the things I like about it actually is you mentioned the relationship with Bert and Sally Field is, again, you can it's that undercurrent of the breakdown in real life being reflected in the characters. And I think you can see a lot of real raw emotion in that film, which is strange for a very, very lightweight film like a Smokey and the Bandit film. Mm. So I think it does add a layer of some kind of emotion to a film that you wouldn't wise or otherwise wouldn't expect to be found in. So it's a, it's, it's kind of a sad film as well in, in that respect when you see those scenes. So yeah. very enjoyable film. Um, of course, the first is my favorite of the three, but I do enjoy the three of them for different reasons. But I think that that for me, that's the notice, noticeable thing in part two is the strange chemistry between the two of them that's happening. Um. There she is with the Daisy Duke shorts on, Sally Field. And Sally Field looks great in this film. Um, sure yeah, because I, um, she looks great in this film. She looks great in Hooper. Um, and um, the Bandit Frog and Justice are at it again. It, it was, I don't think as a kid I realised her character was called Frog. <laughs> I'm not even sure I understood. I must have missed why she was called Frog. That must have escaped my attention. Um, but that's the UK cinema quad that was going by the way on eBay for about 400 quid. So if you've got a Smokey and the Bandit 2 poster, it's worth a few bob. Um, but I liked it. Um, that's my number, um, three choice. Um, David says, um, Hooper number three for the stuntmen milieu and state of mind at the times. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's a wonderful wonderful film one of my favorite burnt movies we're, 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 we are going to get into it in a minute <laughs> i won't i won't get into it now because i'll get david to talk about it when when we get into it more thoroughly but it's coming back in this list i'll, I'll tell you now um so um you know uh i, I think um yeah gator's <laughs> gator's saying that um 
uh, Sally ruined the film put by putting zero effort in. I, I don't know that that's true. I, I, I thought she brought something different to it. Um, but was, listen, man, agree to disagree. You know, I was thinking that, like, you know, um, when you think of that Woody Allen movie, Husbands and Wives, where him and Mia Farrow are clearly having a breakdown on screen as well as in real yeah. life. It's yeah. kind of the version of that only with Bert and Sally. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good, uh, that's a good point. Okay. So I'm just adding that to the uh, list. Um, Smoking the Bandit 2. Someone else voted for Smoking the Bandit. Anyone else with number three choices? Put them in the chat now. Yeah, let me unmute David. There we go. David is now unmuted. Thank you, Melbourne. Um, so uh, we're on to our number two choices then um, of uh, our top five for Reynolds movies. If you're going to vote for one in the chat, please prefix your choice with the number two. Uh, Wayne, what you got? You mentioned it already. Sharky's Machine. Okay. Which <laughs> is an incredible. David, you're allowed incredible. to contribute. <laughs> Sharky's oh, Machine. You. Well, I'm a... sure you've got more to say about, about it on top of what I said already. So please jump in. Well, yeah, many reasons. Again, personal and aesthetic and otherwise. Um, personally speaking, it was, again, one of the earliest movies I was introduced to um i think it may have even I've, I've, i had seen bits and pieces of it down the years but it, many years ago then my brother-in-law brian gave me a copy of it on vhs which stuck at me until i was able to upgrade to dvd for when i was reviewing or researching for this book but um i think aesthetically speaking it's absolutely superb again so you have william fraker cinematographer with nick mclean as the camera operator i mean with those two working together it's going to be a blast and uh, nick mclean has detailed some of his efforts on that film. And what you mentioned earlier on, Lance, that helicopter shot that mm. flies so close to the hotel that you can see it kind of starting to shudder, you know, and Nick talked about that. But it's the kind of stunts that Bert, you know, would encourage from his, his crew. You know, he was daring like that. And he had the ideal cameraman in Nick to be able to pull off some daring stunts. I mean, that's what Nick was able to do on many films. And I think it's just a wonderful, again, like Hustle only kind of a few years later, we're talking into the 80s now, neo-noir. I mean, it's going back to the 40s. And in fact, Bert was a big fan of a 40s, I think it was 44 film noir called Laura. And this is essentially Laura transposed to 1981. It's I, The story is almost identical. The whole situation with Rachel Ward's character, Domino, is absolutely identical to Laura. Um, the situation is the same where her housemate is killed by accident and she's disfigured mm. by a shotgun blast, so they can't identify her. They think it's Don Domino. So Domino uses this as a chance to get out of you know the control of her kind of her pimps or the gang she's working for as a as a prostitute and Bert as the cop who's kind of her savior. So in many ways, I can see it's Bert's love letter to old Hollywood and film noir and in particular to Laura. But other things about it, you know, you think. Henry Silva, who is absolutely wonderful as this menacing, silent assassin stalking Bert. And you have Victorio Gassman then as the, the gangster bringing that kind of, you know, over the top charm, I guess you could call it, to his gangster role. But yeah, it's just a good time movie. But there's a lot of gritty elements. As, again, you mentioned earlier on, it's the Dirty Harry in Atlanta kind of thing. Mm. And I just think it's a wonderfully made film. It's a film I can return to time and time again. And how many other gritty cop movies of the 1980s have a random ninja scene in the middle as well. I mean, come I on. I know, right? That kind of comes yeah. out of nowhere. It was just so quintessential Bert in an aspect of his character. He had that guy in there. That was, I mean, I, you know, you've talked to Nick about him, I'm sure. And I have friends who knew Bert and he did, he had that cop in there. You know, yeah. that was a part of his personality. I think that's why I liked it. Yeah, and it's it it harbors both his romantic side and the kind of hard edged nature that he was yeah. so brilliant uh, at harnessing, and it's it's a very romantic film as well. I think that's something we 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 tend to forget. It's quite a it's a it's a lengthy piece. It's over two hours, I think, and much of that is devoted to his and Rachel Ward's love story, and yeah. that's really the heart of, heart of the film. Reason, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because he 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 falls in love with her. Um, essentially as a as a result of staking out her apartment really yeah um but certainly differently 
different tonally to the film stakeout. It's not not yeah. not, not uh, so um, um, yeah, it, it means a lot to me in terms of again. It's you mentioned earlier on, Lance, the the, the VHS clamshell from the eighties, yeah. a perennial in all the VHS stores around here. And I always remember checking it out and wanting to see it for years. And then it was a little bit later when I saw it, but like I say, I think it was my brother in law that gave me a tape of it, and it just blew me away. It instantly became one of the quality Burt Reynolds films, you know. So that's also David's. Um second choice which is going to really put it up there in terms of the overall points uh scoring until we have the uh final points from our swedish jury uh other other people smoking the uh bandit uh, as their number as uh gators number two i think i can guess what his number one's going to be um hooper for for uh ben shock lead we've got a vote for deliverance we've got another vote for uh smoking the bandit one um, and another vote for Mean Machine, which in America was called The Longest Yard and was also remade in the UK um, with uh, the same name, Mean Machine, as a British version, which my friend Jason Fleming uh, is in playing one of the uh, newscasters during the football game. Um, well, my number two choice, uh, which has already been mentioned um, a number of times, is uh, Hooper. And um, I rewatched it today because I I needed to make sure that it was as good as I fondly remembered it, and I wasn't kind of looking back with rose tinted glasses. And um, one of the reasons that the film really stuck with me was because this was the moment in my life and I probably was about, I don't know, 10 or 11 or something when I saw it, um, that I realized that there was such a thing called a stunt man. And because when my mum used to ask me what I wanted to do when I get older, I, I'd always say I want to be James Bond. And I thought that if I was James Bond, I'd get to like drive all the cool cars and, you know, dive off mountains with skis on whilst firing a machine gun and taking out four people simultaneously. But I didn't actually realize that people called stuntmen did all those things um, for the most part. And um, what I really liked about this movie and David mentioned earlier, um, and we, w we will hear from you extensively on this one, David, um, is, is that um, this is the film that really put, um, Stuntmen on the map. Gone in 60 seconds came four years before this, but it didn't get as wide a big uh, distribution because it didn't have the Burt Reynolds name or a name at that of that calibre. Um, and um, you could tell that they got everybody from the stunt business to be in this movie, and they tried to include all of the big types of stunts that movies were being asked to do at that time and all the small ones as well, and they put them in the, the film. Um, you know, including all the Wild West stuff by having a scene set in a Wild West show. Um, and although the plot could have felt relatively flimsy around that, the, the, the storyline is actually pretty good. Um, yeah. And I watched it again today and I liked it more than when I saw it as a kid because I really appreciated the level of work that went into it. And I also appreciated that the people that made it I think made it very much with the intention of telling everybody, Hey, by the way, this is what stunt men do and it's dangerous and it's not, not an easy um, living. But I did like the fun scene when they're all drunk zooming down the highway and they're jumping cars and passing each other beer cans and doing three sixties and all of this madness. But David, uh, do you want to elaborate further on why you picked it? Well, I'm I'm not sure, but um, wasn't that Hal Needham who did the stunt coordinating? It was, yeah, yeah okay. he directed. So it. Th that, I mean, Bert is taking a direct feed from Hal Needham, and it shows. Um, I knew a lot of the kids who were working, uh, like Buddy Joe Hooker was uh, one of the stunt people that uh, Hal Needham brought up. And I just uh, remember uh, from from knowing people like Joe in those years that the portrayal of you know Jan Michael Vincent and and and, um, and Bird and all these people 
was very close to the mindset that these people had. And it was uh, just, I think, as you guys have been saying, at the point where th the stuntman as an actual integral part of an action film was actually breaking from below the surface up into visibility for the general public. And um, I like that aspect of it too. It helped bring those people out. We're still yeah. trying to get them into the damn guild and, yeah. and the academy. And we can't, I mean, it's unbelievable that they're not um, to this day, given the, the status and the recognition that they deserve. But this was uh, part of the beginning. Yeah, I think it's a good example of Bert using, as he did several times throughout his career, his power to really do something that he felt needed to be highlighted in Hollywood. Exactly. You know, and having good. come from the, the stunt world himself, he knew all too well about the the highs and lows of you know the pain and the effort that goes into it, and it really well, shows. He did a lot of his own stunts, didn't he, Wayne? He did. He did yeah. indeed. Yeah, and suffered quite a bit. I mean, I think that took its toll by the time he got to his later years. Yeah, yeah, and and I think um, it helped him realize in a big way how valuable these people were. I mean, you take a couple of knocks on the head as a star, and you realize why you have some people there because you know they can add uh, a knowledge factor and a safety factor and a choreography factor that many times you know, no matter how good an actor you are, no matter how athletic you are you won't have that kind of background and experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think this poster actually does do it justice for once because it is, what I, what I remember of Hooper growing up is it was the ultimate Saturday afternoon Burt Reynolds movie. You know, it was a good time. It mm. was, you know, full of adventure and stunts. But, you know, as you grow older, and this is the one thing I love about some of Burt's movies, as you grow older with them, you discover more of what was going on in them in terms of some things he was trying to say about the industry or... Exactly. whatever it was about society and this is definitely one of Bert's you know it's there's there's commentary there but it's it's nicely woven among the entertainment neither is missing out on it is the subtext of the movie yeah absolutely. um Gator says you'll find the hoop hooper deleted scenes on his YouTube page I will definitely check those out mate thank you for letting us <laughs> know um David Macy's asking did this inspire the Lee Majors series which he's talking about the full guy of course which used to screen on friday nights in the uk it, i think it couldn't have hurt 7 30. i have a feeling that there there was i, I think that, that that sort of this movie coming out and it was quite successful i think led to discussions um that led to hey well why don't we why don't people start pitching ideas for a stuntman tv show and as I recall, the the full guy. I saw most of the full guy. It was a pretty good, pretty good show. And I always remember the opening had scenes from Sky Riders, which is another big favourite film of mine from the seventies that most people haven't seen. Um, but it's on my retro reviews. If guys want to check it out, and it has the Silver Street. Sorry, lads. yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think the relationship between Sally Field and Burton this is also quite raw. You know, it's not just a played for laughs kind of. Roman. No, they've, they've, yeah, that, yeah, and it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it, 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 she's quite, um, she doesn't play the character the same way as other characters. At the beginning, it feels like, oh, it's them being them in the maybe the first scene, yeah. um, but that doesn't last. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's a great film. Uh, I, I loved it. I it was, it was, it was, it was nearly my number one. It was a toss up. Um, and I really had to, um, uh, yeah, I had to think long and hard. Yeah, okay. it, was, it was definitely one that Bert um, harnessed his power to get made. You know, I think he had done maybe Cannonball 2, or I can't remember which one it was, one of the big ones that the studios wanted him to do, and his kind of power play was, well, was, well I'll do that for you, but next movie I want to make Hooper. Well, before we, um, before we get to our number one choices, including you, chat, don't put them in yet um i'm going to add up the points and see where we are now um so uh we've got uh and uh, actually let me do that and maybe wayne you could just talk about 
some of the movies that didn't make the list, but that you particularly like of Burt's? God, where do I start? Well, you know, I think one of one of the interesting things about Burt is, again, that he doesn't seem to get credit for was the amount of interesting filmmakers that he worked with over the years. You know, serious heavy hitter filmmakers, and I would go to starting over. You know, the Alan J. Pecula romantic comedy, uh, which is very good. Um, the Man Who Loved Women, Blake Edwards, his mm -hmm. second Blake Edwards film. Um, what else? He's he, he's done an avant-garde art film with Mike Figgis called Hotel in the early 2000s. He did Citizen Root with Alexander Payne, which I think was his first film. So again, Burt's kind of working his way through all these different periods of American cinema, which, you know, he, he's not necessarily associated with, certainly not associated with the, the American independent movement. So, um, yeah, and then he, he's worked multiple times with Peter Bogdanovich, who, you know, he's kind of lampooned there with the director in Hooper, but he did two terrific films with Peter Bogdanovich, including Nickelodeon and At Long Last Love, which were absolute love letters to old classic cinema. And you know, one of the things about Burt was he was kind of a, a bit of a, a champion and film historian of old Hollywood. So he was fascinated by that. So him working with Bogdanovich, you know, was a match made in heaven, if you ask me. But then you also have got the great Western, the man who loved cat dancing, where, you know, it's a story written by Eleanor Perry, who was writing, you know, with her husband, Frank Perry, these great kind of social realist melodramas. And here she is writing a Burke Reynolds Western, and it is, it's a very unusual, very original feminist Western, you know, very original for the time. I can't think of any other Western that would come close to it in terms of its feminist politics, apart from maybe William Weldman's West, Westward to Women back in the 40s. So um, he's done all these very, very interesting things. Uh, Best Friends, directed by Norman Jewison, which was a lovely little romantic comedy with Goldie Hawn. God, and then there's myriad films that he's done in between his early ones one of, one of his earliest films actually i would consider one of his most interesting which was called um what was it? it was a different fade in i think it was called over here but it was a different iron cowboy maybe in some territories and again it's this very late 60s easy rider-esque art movie you know him and barbara loden he plays a small town farmhand she's an actress who comes to town to make a movie and it's a kind of a movie within a movie and it's very experimental and it's very unusual to see Bert in this kind of picture but again he's 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 doing all these kind of movies in between the stuff we're talking about here tonight which is you know what he's famous for like the likes of Smokey and the Bandit and Cannibal Run and Sharky's Machine so um yeah Jesus I can't I'm trying to think of the whole 120 films that I covered in the book but it, they're eluding me because there's just too many of them so, yeah, it's he's a, an embarrassment of riches. So, buy my book and then go through each film one by one. Well, one of his um, later movies, which didn't make it on my list, but I, I did enjoy it. I thought it was a good action film, particularly the bad guy protagonist who went round with his machine gun and motorcycle helmet on killing everybody. Do you remember the one I'm talking about If uh, with that clue? It was called Rent a Cop, I believe. Rent a Cop. That was um, James Ramar was the cop. Yeah, he was the assassin. Yeah, he was the bad guy. That's right. Yeah, Liza Minnelli. Yeah, that was um, Jerry London, who I approached for the book, and he sent me a one-line email response, which is, I will never talk about that movie or Burt Reynolds ever. <laughs> right, okay. So I left it at that. <laughs> that said a lot. Yeah. yeah, I guess he didn't have an enjoyable time uh, making that film then. Yeah, it was apparently quite difficult and bombed spectacularly. So uh, nobody seemingly wanted to talk about that. Okay. Um, well, could I just, could I on, just throw in Deliverance? Because <clears throat> it, I mean, it got a lot of notoriety and everything, but it really was another aspect of Bert, you know, that he could jump into that guy. Too, yeah. and I thought that was pretty amazing. Yeah, and again, he's representing something there, you know, about America. Each of those four characters is some different part of you know the the American right. social fabric, and I think he brought an interesting, in a way, he's kind of playing up his the masculine character that he is so known for, and yet he is the one who, 
is quite he's both a hero but also quite a flawed character in that so you know he's multi-dimensional and it's just um you could look at that movie as a heroic part movie but if you look beneath the surface he's one who was extremely flawed and you could say kind of encouraged a lot of the unfortunate action that occurs in the film exactly yeah no i i I liked it for that reason that he that he played a a one-off of of his usual character yeah yeah terrific film um gary bolt is in the chat who is one of the members of the uh outcast creative from australia and has co-hosted many a show with me uh gary actually i sent you the link earlier in case you did want to pop on so uh we haven't got to number one yet jim stop stop looking at the christmas presents under the tree i'm going to recap the points first so okay here's where we are so um trailing at the back with one point each are White Lightning, um, Cannibal Run, Cannibal Run 2, um, Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, <coughs> uh, and uh, Sam Whiskey. Then um, I've got several films that have scored three points, which is Hustle, Gator, City Heat, and Smokey and the Bandit 2. Um, then we have uh, Deliverance, which has scored four points, Smokey and the Bandit one, which has scored 12, seven, lead in uh, second place, joint second place. We've got Hooper, um, and the longest yard, but first place at the moment is Sharky's Machine with 14 points. Well deserved. So, uh, it's it's so we'll see what the number ones are. And uh, see how that's going to change things. So now, Jim, you can, as you've already got Cannibal Run, so that's five points extra for Cannibal Run. Okay, so uh, Cannibal Run is now, uh, well, I'll, I'll add them down here. So Cannibal Run is uh, one for Jim. I'll go through the ones in chat in a second. Okay, so um, what do you have, Wayne, for your number one? <laughs> <laughs> I would not have seen that coming. And you've got a script for it as well. Again, multiple I, I, reasons why this is my number one Burt movie for very personal reasons. But I do love it. It's just, a, again, a terrific action movie. It always intrigued me ever since I first saw it in the late 80s. And I believe I saw the wrong version of it because it was on BBC back in, I'd say about 89, 90. And it was a different version. It was, it had country music. It had, um, I can't remember the actress's name, Annie Potts. In it. There was a different ending. There was different scenes throughout. So I think they had accidentally shown what was to be Bert's original version. But then, you know, I rented it and it was a completely different piece altogether. This was the theatrical cut, which was very, very glossy. It had a kind of a, you know, Beverly Hills cop-esque synthesizer score mm-hmm. rather right. than the country, country score. But um, I was fascinated by, you know, just the fact that there was two different cuts and I just I thought it was brilliant. It was just kind of seedy, you know, it's it's set in Florida, you know, the kind of sunshine and the, the beaches, but yet there's this seedy kind of gangster element going on. His Bert, home state. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So Bert on home turf and um, the beautiful Candace Bergen. But um, again, Nick McLean is the cinematographer in this. The cinematography is absolutely stunning. Um, my friend Michael Shea is also in there. He's the camera operator. And I met on this chapter, I think this is the biggest chapter in the book, actually, because I dug into it so much. It's making of, and I spoke to several people, including Nick, Mike, and one of the people that Nick introduced me to, who became a very dear friend of mine, was Jimmy Lewis. Now, Jimmy Lewis was an actor, and he was also Bert's stunt double stand-in and friend of 40, 50 years, whatever it was. So they were very close. They lived in the same small town, Jupiter. And it was Jimmy, actually, who gave me this script. You know, this is his. This is his revised first draft screenplay with his name on it and notes and everything, all the different colored pages dated at... Um, yeah, Jimmy just gave me some wonderful insights into his life and work with with Bert across many films and he just wanted me to have that I'm not a big collector of things in general uh, especially memorabilia but you know he said Wayne if there's one person 
who would appreciate this script it's you and you know flipping through it just bringing back memories there jim passed away there about a year and a half ago and um he was just a wonderful guy and when i think of stick i think of jim i think of my friends nick and mike and bert and it's just a I guess it's more than the film itself. Yeah. Uh, I need I need to rewatch it. I've only seen it once. Uh, it was a renter. It was a renter on video. Um, I can't remember um, disliking it. I do remember George Siegel was a pretty good bad guy in it, if I remember. Right. Uh, well, Charles Durning was the villain. Villain. Um, Charles um, George Siegel was kind of like you know he's the the go between the the hero and the. The villain although stick himself isn't exactly he's not the, the cleanest hero you could say he's you know he's fresh out of prison he's a criminal he's gone back into the underworld kind of thing but yeah that was the yeah. cover of the uk vhs right yeah. there charles durning you know he's he's almost clownish with the, the red wig and the makeup and all this but um it's it's an absurd action movie and it's <clears> you know it, it's an elmore leonard adaptation which oh, is really yeah it's, it's a bit more grittier obviously on the, on the page than what ended up on screen but it's, it's an interesting film to dig into for, for me as the like, film historian i guess looking at the, why there was two cuts what went on you know with universal yeah. and as bert would say his battles with the black terror you know that went on because bert at this stage was he commercially i guess you could say on the decline because he, I, there was a city heat was a bit of a flop and then i think yeah. all of his movies throughout the 80s were successive flops yeah, he did a um, he did a string of turkeys that all went effectively. So at, at this stage, yeah. he was starting to lose the autonomy he had over his work, and uh, yeah. obviously, this was a huge thing for him. You know, he, he had serious battles with um, Universal over this film, and it's an interesting. If you can ever find a bootleg or whatever of that original uh, Burt's version of the film, it's it, it gives you an idea of what he was trying to do, which was very much yeah southern in feel and tone you know the music is all these kind of country artists and Dinah Shore who he was he was with uh, and then you look at the theatrical version and it's highly edited it's um very glossy there's a certain kind of a commercial action 80s action sheen to it but it's it's just a movie that I find very fun I find very intriguing from like I say industrial production contexts but uh means a lot more to me outside of that as well it reminds me of jimmy and nick and mike and friends i've made on this book and if that's if there's one thing i took away from this book many friends many good friends uh the script that you've got i take it was closer to bert's vision it's pretty identical to what's in the theatrical version because i think this is what they were ah what they were okay. filming um uh, david you had something you wanted to say earlier No, just agreeing. Just agreeing. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, okay. So uh, that's Wayne's number one choice. We've got votes for number one on Cannonball as well as Cannonball Run 2. <laughs> Why that would be anyone's number one Burt Reynolds choice is beyond me. But anyway, who heard one as well? Um, Sharky's Machine, we got two votes for number one. Smokey and the Bandit, one uh, a vote for number one um as well um so uh and another vote for cannibal one run cannibal run one um so that's two okay gonna add these up in a sec uh all right so uh my number one uh has already been uh mentioned a couple of times um by other people in the chat it was renamed in the uk i first saw it on the tv and then I rented it. Uh, I think the first time it was shown on British television, it was very late at night. Uh, it wasn't cut, which was good. Um, and that was The Mean Machine, The Longest Yard. Now, this was um, a difficult one for me to pin down because it was, it was, it was between this, Hooper, uh, and um, The Last Movie Star. But The Last Movie Star obviously isn't Bert in his prime. And I, I felt I should look to his earlier films for my number one choice. And the two strongest for me in terms of rewatch value were always Mean Machine and Hooper because they were so much fun. I think this one, um, 
man managed the number one spot because the more I thought about it, Me Machine is one of those rare films that manages to juggle a tone of comedy, drama, and some pretty dark stuff as well, um, uh, successfully um, and, and quite quickly from one scene to another. And there's not a lot of films that can do that. Burt's in his prime in the movie. All of the football stuff is incredibly well uh, directed. Uh, Ed Lauter makes um, a perfect sort of number two to Eddie Albert's number one uh, bad guy. Um, I really like the actor who plays caretaker. I think that might be Mike Conrad. And, of course, the scene where he gets set on fire, you never forget that scene. I remember two people talking about that in school you know the following day and us all going my god did you see that film last time yeah they go when the guy got you pulled on the light and exploded and, and they recreated that scene in another movie called codename the soldier which was shown as a double bill with a terrible british science fiction film called extro and they did codename <laughs> the soldier as a double bill with extro why i have no idea but we really wanted to see codename the soldier because it was made by the same production team as the exterminator and that had been a big hit on video in the uk it also got banned and um the trailer for codename the soldier was was very strong so me and my friend lied about our age and we got in to see those movies and they have an, an identical scene where a guy puts on a light bulb and, and explodes and i i turned to my friend and said god that's just like the scene in Moon machine so um yeah, it's a really good good movie. It's been remade twice, I think. Uh, Adam Sandler did a version as well. Can't claim to have seen that one. Uh, I have seen the British version. The British version's fine. It's it's just not as good. Um, and I like the ending of the film um, as well. Particularly the I like the arc of the character and you know that line where uh, was that time where that guy got hit in the face? Is that worth ten years? And the guy turns to him and says, yeah, that's worth 10 years. And then he goes out and he plays the game properly. So I, I really, I really liked it. Um, it's interesting that Al Ruddy turned down Godfather 2 to produce Mean Machine. Um, I did not know that. Um, uh, but uh, the show called The Offer, um, uh, that is produced. And the first two direct uh, episodes are directed by a friend of mine, Dexter Fletcher. Uh, and that is a fantastic show. Um, if people haven't seen it, uh, David McGifford, what would be your number one choice? Well, I, I wrote it to you. Um, it's Smokey and the Bandit because it's so pure Burt Reynolds, his romanticism, his off handed sense of humor, um, combined with his intelligence that, as I wrote to you, always showed through no matter how ridiculous the script situation. Um, I, you know, I just, I thought it encompassed a lot of who he was as a person. And also I worked with Sally Field right after that. Right. And, and she just was still spinning from being around Bert. She just said he was so mercurial and so fast on his feet and so smart and so fun. And then so deft at things that he wanted to have happen in the film that weren't actually in the script and how he got them to, to include it in the script. So um, that's, I mean, it, it's kind of obvious in one sense, but, but the reasons that I like it aren't maybe as obvious. Um, now that's, I think that's fine. Um, I'm just going to address this comment. Um, Gator, who's, clearly a, a, a big Burt Reynolds fan has put, I get the personal choices you're all making. Perhaps the title to this YouTube video should be guilty pleasures um, or my favorite, but I'm going to disagree with that really strongly um, because my guilty pleasures are not going to be the same as somebody else's guilty pleasures. One of my guilty pleasures might be somebody else's favorite film of all time. And that's entirely um, their opinion. And all art is subjective, whatever art is. Um, so these are just our five choices. We said at the beginning what the reasons for our picking um, our criteria was. Like David has just said, his number one choice is because it's it's pure Burt. And I get 100% uh, where you're coming from with that. It is 
it's the epitome of mm. Burt Reynolds' charm, charisma, the kind of thing he would breeze through and also would be a big hit at the box. And office. very fast on his feet. Yeah. Very, very fast mind. Quick. Uh, that was one of his highlights. Um, I, I would just agree in the sense that it kind of shows, you know, what a wide range he had. And it's, I don't think it's surprising that a lot of people have different choices. Um, I think it would be hard pressed to find a top five for someone with a body of work that big. It, I mean, I, 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 I agonized over this list. Uh, you know, things went in and out, in and out, in and out. Deliverance went in and out like four times, um, you know, simply because it is such a brilliant, brilliantly shot and acted film. But I I didn't enjoy watching it at the time because I was too young. And when I watched it as an adult, I didn't particularly enjoy it either, even though I could appreciate what a brilliant movie it is. But I don't own it. It's not in my uh, collection. Um, because I just know it's not one I'm going to, oh, what, should, what film should I watch today? I oh, know, I'm feeling a bit down. I'll whack Deliverance on. That's just not going to happen <laughs> for me. Um, you know, there, there's there's several films that I've seen only once that I don't want to see again, but I think they're brilliant movies. The Cook, The Thief, His Wife and Her Lover is is another one I could I could put on that, that list. Um but uh, yeah, I mean, and I my 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 top five are a mixture of kind of some of his more big budget studio movies, and then some of the ones he had more control over, and then one of his later um, films. So, but they they all meant something to me, and I probably found his last film the most moving. Um, David, go on. Well, I I just want to say, you know, if you haven't read Wayne's book it will give you a, a huge insight also into more aspects of Bird and the people who worked around him. Um, and it, it fleshes out even this discussion that we've been having for the last hour and a half or so. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, uh, yes, Wayne is a friend of mine, but it's also a hell of a book. Thank you. And I, and I also have it and I also recommend it, particularly if you want to, know the psychology behind this. it will give you a much better understanding behind why Bert chose uh, to do the various films that he did at the different times and maybe also what he was hoping that some of them would be as opposed to what they turned out I mean yeah. I didn't know until yeah. we did this stream that there were two different cuts of stick yeah. that existed um, I'd, I'd really like to see the other yeah, um, I, I tried to get a mix of voices in there from people who had worked with him through different stages of his career, right up to the most recent ones, and including his kind of maligned '90s and early 2000s work, which is you know largely unseen. So, um, you know, I tried to balance it out in kind of give everything a bit of objectivity and production and behind the scenes. But for me, it was like all of my books; it starts out with a personal connection, and I think ultimately, it's it's my it's my tribute to Bert in many ways, but um, as I say, it's become a, a very meaningful piece of work for me personally and professionally. As I say, it led on to further work, but it also led on more importantly to the most important thing, which is people in your life, friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, for anybody who doesn't know, Wayne has met and interviewed and become friends with a number of people who've worked with um, Bert. Uh, on numerous Burt Reynolds productions, uh, particularly Nick McLean, who was the DOP on on many films uh, with him, and a camera operator um, on many films with Burt. Right. Well, the numbers are in. Um, we've got we've got a tie for second place, um, but we've got we definitely we've got a clear winner. Uh, we've got so that's number one, two, two. Three, number five. Uh, well, number five is um, that can't. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, right. Okay, so uh, what do people guess? Uh, so the, the voting poll is now closed. You can't vote now, chat. So if you didn't vote, too late. Um, so what do you think number five was, people? 
So I'm just going to explain how this worked. If you voted for a film in the number five spot, including our votes, it scored one point. In the number four spot, it scored two points. In the number three spot, it scored three points. In the number four spot, you know, and so on and so on and so on. So the, uh, the so the number one films scored five points in a descending order. Um, so yeah, what do we think came in fifth? Any any guesses? Only scoring um, eight points uh, overall. It was Deliverance. So <laughs> Deliverance is the number five. Um, choice. Um, then we have uh, number four. Any guesses on uh, number four? Going to be like the, the longest yard or something like that. I can I can nearly guess the top five. <laughs> uh, it's not um, the longest yard. It's not. Uh, it's not the longest yard. Smoking the banner. Uh... No, that is in a different place. <laughs> That's on there, uh, but it's uh, it's not. Uh, no, so that's uh, no sign of cop and a half. No, no, co no, no sign of uh, cop and a half. Um, the uh, number four uh, scoring uh, place is the Cannonball Run, the first one. So um, the first Cannibal Run movie, actually. So I'll stick these on a banner so we can we can pop pop them up. So uh, number five, Deliverance. Uh, number four is the Cannibal Run. I get why, because the Cannibal Run is, uh, you know, an effect uh, with great affection uh, for a lot of people. I saw it at the cinema. I saw the second one at the cinema. Um, the reason it's not in my top five list is I see it as an ensemble piece film. It's not really a Burt Reynolds movie. It's a film in which Burt Reynolds is one of several stars. Um, uh, so for me, it's, it, it doesn't come. Uh, it, di it didn't get in. Neither of them I entertained as being in my top five. I don't think they would have even been in my top ten. But I get why people have a lot of affection um, for them. At the third place was Sharky's Machine, scoring a total of 14 points overall. And um, it's because several people put it high up. It was on my list, of course. Um, so uh, that was um, number three. Then we have two films at the joint number one, uh, number two spot. Um, two films at the um, joint number two spot. Uh, they are Smokey and the Bandit. Both of these uh, films uh, scored um, 17 points. Uh, so Smokey and the Bandit was one of them. And the second one was Hooper. Uh, and the funny thing is, that means that my number one pick is actually the number one choice because it scored the most points from everybody, including the people in chat. Uh, it scored 22 points, so it was the clear leader by five points. So, um, yeah, so uh, the final list, guys, is Deliverance in number five, the Cannonball Run, number four, Sharky's Machine, number three, Smoking the Bandit and Hooper, joint second place, and The Longest Yard as the number one film. The people um, have spoken. So yeah, um, and there's uh, there's a lot of uh, people in chat giving uh, Sharky's Machine a shout out. So clearly, uh, there's some fondness um, uh, for that movie, uh, which is nice to see. Um, so um, uh, people don't seem to look too upset. Ben Shockley obviously feeling cop and a half should have been in the in the top five. Um, Wayne does actually like that movie. Um, so there are two of you that, that do like it. Um, <laughs> I, I, do you know what? I don't think I've actually seen it. It's just uh, a fun, it's a fun, good time. Oh, hang on. Uh, David's, uh, David, you're muted. I think you've muted yourself because I can't unmute you. So, uh, David's, I could see David's mouth moving and he wasn't talking. You're, you, you're muted, um, somehow there. Yeah, don't know what's happened there. Uh, just keep fiddling and we'll 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 tell you when we can hear you. Um yeah, uh 
uh, some people have mentioned uh, Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights was a terrific comeback for uh, Burt, but I would I would argue that it was Mark Wahlberg's film, really, and that that Burt was a supporting um, character in that. Still can't get your audio, David. I'll just drop you out for a second while you try and reboot and fix. And uh, we'll, um, we'll give me, I can still see, can still see David, so he can he can wave at me frantically when. Uh, um, ben Shockley says I'm missing out on Cop and a Half, um, and I love Boogie Nights. And Boogie Nights was a film I considered putting in because he's such he's so good in it. Um, and maybe it's a good thing. I think we've got David. I think David, we got you back. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, yeah, Re Reynolds is amazing in Boogie Nights, but it's, for me, it, it wasn't a Burt Reynolds movie. I, I saw an interesting question by David May Macy. Did you see that one? That says, question to Wayne, was Burt the first to put bloopers over the end titles? That was a trend that was started in Hooper. That's what I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah, um, I think I mentioned that. On if the, not, he was sure he was sure one of the early ones. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was first started in Hooper, um, and uh, actually, there's only a couple of shots where it's kind of outtakes. Mm. The rest of it is extra stunt footage, or or just longer takes of the stunts you've already seen, mm. and they just wanted to show off more yeah. stuff with the the stuntmen, and then that then lent into the trend of oh well how about we put all the bloopers on the end of it which then jackie chan actually said in an interview he got his inspiration from hooper to to to, to show what you know you've got that it's like the injury reel isn't it on the end of a jackie chan movie it's it's all the yeah. shots of oh. either him or his stuntmen <laughs> being carried away in ambulances yeah um, um you wouldn't get hollywood <laughs> films showing that because that'd be evidence in a lawsuit it sure um, would some people yeah. would say that the outtakes of Cannonball Run are funnier than the movie itself. So yeah, they well they are hilarious. Uh, I, Which yeah. film was it where where the car goes under the stone tower that's going over? I can't oh, remember. God. I don't know why. I think that was Cannonball Two. It might have been. Which, sorry, know. say that again, David. Uh, yeah, that was that was the one that Nick did. Cannonball Two. Well, you know, Buddy Joe was driving that car. Oh wow! <laughs> and. Um, who, if you don't know, he's a very famous stunt coordinator now and second unit director, but he was also the other halfback on my high school football team with me. We've been friends for a really long time. And when to hear him talk about how that stunt was carried off, there were no calculations. It was all done by eye. He either made it or he didn't. And, and the only adjustments that he had were on the throttle or brake as he was going toward this thing falling. You know, nowadays people would, would not allow him to do that. They just wouldn't allow him. And, but that was Hal Needham and that was, uh, Buddy who, Joe. Who was driving that car? Did you say? Buddy Joe Hooker. Buddy Joe Hooker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just, so you're saying it was a chimney falling over. Yeah. Because there's it was a the huge of, like furnace chimney or um yeah, smelter of, chimney or something, and they didn't the end, have two of them, they only had one, and they only had yeah. one stunt guy. At the end of Hooper, there's a scene with a with a stone chimney when they do mm. that long car shot with all the different things exploding, and one of the things they they blow up is a an old like an it feels like an old chimney that you'd then seen. That, that would have been. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted to throw that in there because I, I just find that every time I see it, I just think that thing is so extraordinary. And then when you know the setting of it too, that there was nothing, there was no fallback. There was no safety thing you could do. No, no, you know? yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm just, I'm curious to, oh yeah, here we go, buddy Joe Hooker uh, and and, he, and his brother, Billy Hank Hooker. Hank Hooker, yeah. Did, did that. That was on Hooper, uh, yep. not Cannibal okay. Runs. Yeah. I just found it. Um, Crazy. So, I mean, yeah. Well, just that. I mean, that was that was why I loved Hooper so much. It, the, the, the stunts, you know, they were, they were, it was a statement, really, that these guys are. That's how they were doing it in those yeah. days. They didn't have all these 
you know, computer calculations and stuff that they've had to do because things have gotten so much more complex. But these were guys who just, you know, they were smart, but they they didn't have all the uh, the manpower and the brain power that they bring to stunts now. Yeah. Nick was a great um, source of that, talking about the stunt work, because obviously mm -hmm. he was working very closely with the the aerial units on that, on the likes of Cannonball 2 and the other films. And I think there was an incredible stunt in Cannonball 2, which was a helicopter going on a bridge or something like that. And yeah. That, yeah. Top, and then it was on top of the, the limo. Yeah. And I remember Nick telling me about that, how dangerous and, you know, how just kind of mad those kind of stunts were. But that's that's why they hired Nick and he was able to pull it off. And that's why. He and was, it was really dangerous for Nick. Yeah, absolutely. Really yeah. Dangerous. And that's, you can see how Bert and Nick really gelled to make the movies they did. Yeah. It, it, it amazes me that they're just, I, mean, I don't understand why there isn't a best stunt category uh, in, in, in the Oscars. Uh, I know there's, that they have a no stunt excuse. award. There's no excuse anymore. No, I mean, it, it's it's a major facet of many films. Um, and, and you've got some pretty, I can't remember the list in its entirety, but there are some pretty niche awards like best song written for a film and if if the academy was to argue that well not every movie has a stunt in it you could say well not every movie has a song written for it either so why have you got that category because there's probably just as many stunts in movies in a given year as there are um you know songs written for films so i, I think it's nonsense i can't believe that they've not had this I, I think this category should have come in you know 10 years ago um if not sooner so um, I wonder how long it will be uh, until, I mean, obviously there's someone somewhere and, is probably and, going and to the in general, show. And in general, the film community that I'm in touch with, and I'm actually getting more in touch with people now these days, um, but they all feel that way. This, this is not some couple of people uh, mm. um, coming from left field with a, some weird idea. I mean, this is long overdue. But the Academy is that way. They are not with the times. I mean, I think they've shown them, shown themselves to be behind the times in many situations. But this is a real practical one that they've really missed the boat on. Um, I'm just going to uh, clarify this comment. We saw an interview with Bert, and he listed the massive jobs he turned down, including James Bond, pre Sean Connery. Uh -huh. So that's not entirely true. Uh, he was offered a meeting. Uh, as were many American actors, including like James Brolin was somebody who uh, they took a meeting with. Um, but um, as soon as word got out in the English press um, that uh, the Bond company were meeting American actors uh, for the role of Bond, there was a public outcry in the UK. And um, uh, they, they just could tell that, that uh, it wasn't going to work without an English actor in it. So... Uh, they quickly dumped that idea. Yeah. I think but one I of the ones he also listed was Han Solo on Star Wars. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I don't know whether that's true or not, but um, I, 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 know, I think probably what happened was he probably got offered a meeting and he probably just turned around and said, no, I don't want to do that role. And it, it was it was a right decision because he wouldn't have been right for, for, for Bond. He had the, the suave, but I don't think he would have been able to do an English accent. <laughs> I don't think that's really would have would have been Bert's... Would have, would have had a Georgia draw in there also, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I know Brolin did, Brolin got asked for a meeting, he went for a meeting, and he did a screen test, that's true, and I think that they offered to screen test Reynolds, but that there's a long way from uh, I'm getting a screen test to I'm getting offered the role, and um, when, when word got out that Brolin was in the running, I remember it was in the papers and people mm. were upset. Well, Bert did a there's a really good enjoyable early Bert movie which has Bond elements which is Operation CIA, you know, which was <laughs> late seventies and that that's going back and Bert is doing the whole you know suave uh, espionage thing so I can see that as his screen test certainly. Operation C yeah, that, maybe he he uh, that's nineteen sixty five so that's I can't remember when um, Doctor No came out was that sixty two. Um, mm. Operation CIA. I, I feel we need to look at some pictures of this. Uh, let, let's let's have a quick uh, peek. 
So here we are. It appears Burt Reynolds is in his um, Roger Moore safari outfit surrounded by, I can only describe them best as like um, Vietnam. Uh, I think it's uh, set in people. Thailand, if I remember right. <laughs> yeah, like MVA types. Of course, this would have been at the beginning of the Vietnam War. This would have been or around the time it would uh, just... It was yeah, it was in full swing by sixty five, wasn't it? Yeah. Apparently, uh, he got very sick on location because again, he insisted on doing his own stunts, and he <sighs> dove headfirst into a infested river, which gave him all kinds of ailments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think David uh, coughing to signify Sorry. that he would not do that now. Uh, no. <laughs> No, and it reminded me, it's off topic, but it reminded me of another Buddy Joe Hooker stunt that I did with them on a very small film in Florida. We had to have a car hit a ramp and go into a, a settling pond of some sort. And, you know, we all stood around the edge of it and they put rollers down or whatever it was to see how deep it was. And But the water was completely murky. So we... You know, he, but it just said, okay, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to do it. And, and, uh, you know, it, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. But what, what we didn't understand, well, he, so he, he did the stunt and the car hit the water. And before we could even cut the cameras, he was climbing out and standing on the roof <laughs> because the whole pond was full of water moccasins. Oh, my God. And, oh. and we had not seen any trace of them. Nobody had gone in the water to see, you know, what was there. But this is the kind of thing that would go on then. And we thought we were being safe. Yeah. Damn. That, that, yeah. That. What film was that? You didn't say the title. Um, okay. I, I'm going to have to think. If you could, um, if you could look through your I, 2028 uh, IMDb credits, uh, awesome. David, um, and just let us know which one. I'll, I'll yeah, I'll have to. Um, that'd, mm -hmm. that'd, that'd, that'd be great. Just to mention to everybody watching, I'm about 86 hours away from getting the channel monetized, or I think it's 84. That's the closest I've been in a while because if, if you don't close that gap quickly, then it gets bigger again. YouTube, are a lot of fun at keeping me on my toes with all of that kind of stuff. So, uh, guys, do check out all the other interviews. You should check out the first one I did with uh, Wayne. Uh, where we had a more uh, general discussion about the various books that he's written. You can find the link for this one on Burt Reynolds right down there. It's already in the information uh, underneath. I added that before the stream uh, today. And if you search uh, Wayne Byrne under books, same spelling, of course, which always some somehow your brain tells you is the incorrect spelling when you're typing it out and you feel like the R should come before the Y, but it is correct, <laughs> B-Y. Um, put that into Amazon and you'll see several of um, Wayne's excellent books uh, come up. But he's not a man who's about the gossip. He's about the production and about the art. So yes. if you're exactly. looking for a, a Burt Reynolds, um, you know, who he slept with uh, book, uh, that is not Wayne's book. So, um, you know, uh, and there are plenty. Uh, I think there's plenty of those uh, out there, oh, there are. Including, <laughs> including some that Burt wrote himself. So uh, why not? You know, if you want those, get it get it straight from the, the horse's mouth. So to remind everybody, our top five, as voted for both by ourselves um, and you guys on chat, was Deliverance at number five, Cannibal Run, the first one at number four, Sharky's Machine at number three. Joint second place were the original Smoking and Bandit film and Hooper, uh, which is a personal favourite of mine, and The Longest Yard, also known as The Mean Machine um, in the UK. Uh, was number one, and I'm not surprised it was number one. I, I expected it to be in the 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 top three, and actually, I guess those, those five are kind of representative of many people's, you know, yeah, top five of Bert. And it maybe comes back to what Gator was saying in terms of you know when we think of the top five Bert films, there's there's maybe a top ten even you could choose from, and they're they're there for a reason. They're immensely popular. They're crowd pleasers. They did great at the box office and. Of course, they should be mentioned in any top five, top ten. You know, I think our our approach today was just you know of a more of a personal kind of bent. Yeah. Uh, Vex has said, "Isn't who Burt Reynolds slept with your book, Lance?" Uh, 
I don't know if Burt Reynolds slept with my book, but I didn't. I, I, I'm not sure which book you mean. <laughs> um, we're 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 uh, Vex and I have a very interesting relationship, uh, which the word vexed would would be appropriate. Um, but she is uh, somebody who runs another channel with Canoli Sasquatch, who was in earlier. And if I can stay up for it, which will be an equivalent of an all night stream for me, um, I may be joining them to discuss fellowship of the ring and this sunday all three extended versions of the lord of the rings films are showing at the london prince charles cinema and they completely sold out their first screen they're starting at nine o'clock in the morning so they're doing a second start of the films at 11 um in the second screen and that screen now has only four seats left as well so it just goes to show you how popular right. those films still are. And people always want to see the extended versions. They don't want to go to the cinema to see the original cuts now. Uh, I think I have... I'll just stay home and watch Malone instead. <laughs> well, I've already seen all three of them. Um, when, they, when The Return of the King Extended came out, there was one screening in London on a really big screen of all three together, and it was the first time the extended return of the king was being shown anywhere in the uk and i bought a ticket for that so i've done it but um i'm debating you're a hardier getting... man than i <laughs> yeah i don't know if I, I might i could fall asleep you know that would be embarrassing wouldn't it they are good films though um, i found it so, oh found what was it? it empire of the ants <laughs> oh. empire of the ants is yeah. that the one where they kind of attack the hotel yeah, um, yeah, they attacked a lot of stuff. Yeah, they were radioactive ants. John Collins. Yeah, I think I've seen it. Um, With and, John uh, Collins. It was one of your um, uh, one of your early films that you worked on, if I oh, remember. Oh, boy. That yes. Anyway, Buddy Joe and Hugh and, and uh, were both there. Yeah, Hank Hooker and Buddy Joe. Um, Gator McCluskey says his guilty pleasure Burt film is definitely Gator. Ask him why they call him Bones because I tell him to. I, I I really like Gator. The opening sequence in the swamp is is fantastic. I, I used to just watch that scene again and again, and then I think um, I'm right in thinking. Isn't there like a a brothel with a girl on a big swing? She's swinging outside, and then at one point that brothel gets set on fire, and she's still on the swing. Is that that movie, or is that a different Burt film? It's definitely a Burt movie. Is that sure. ringing bells, Wayne? Can't think of it there. Somebody in chat will know, but that that's yeah. because I think isn't, isn't the bad guy in Gator Jerry Lewis, the actor Je Jerry, the, Jerry Reed. Jerry Reed, sorry. The, yeah. the one who plays the his friend in the Smoking the Bandit yeah. films. My, my brother-in-law is actually in the chat. He was saying to draw your attention to uh, a comment about you can return my clamshell. Sharky was a joke. <laughs> It's Brian McCarthy, just in case you're looking for a name. Or Big Mac. Big Mac. Okay. So um, I, that comment. Um, I, I don't know where that is. Yeah, I mean, it's um, so somebody here saying Burt Reynolds should have played Gandalf. I mean, that would have been inter interesting uh, to, to see, <laughs> uh, certainly. Um, yeah, I, I, there, there, there's, there's a lot of films that I could have easily put in 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 that top five it wasn't like it was an easy um pick and we're doing uh and we're doing another stream where we're talking about the films of michael mann in a couple of weeks director michael mann who did last of the mohicans heat um the insider to name just a few of them and originally we were just going to discuss his films and i said to matt well let's pick a top three out of his movies each and he hasn't made loads of films, and I'm I'm struggling to to oh, which ones am I going to leave out? Because there's like six of his films that I absolutely mm. love. So there's quite a few TV movies as well, doesn't he? Because he has L.A. Takedown, which was the original version of Heat. Uh, it like... was, and I used to have that on video with its five minute version of the twenty five minute gun battle. Yeah, yes, did he do, was there Crime Wave or something? Uh, it oh, was so. an, an, another name for L.A. Heat was L.A. Crime mm. Wave. That was, was that was just a different title for it, but he also did Miami Vice, of course, yeah, and and produced the the whole TV show and uh, all the rest of it. 
So um, anyway, okay. So uh, before we wrap things up, because we've uh, we've gone over our ninety minutes by half an hour as per normal. Um, time flies on this channel, um, and uh, David's going to uh, have to go shortly as well. Uh, Wayne, what what have you got coming up? What have you got uh, coming out? Any new books coming out in the impending future? Yes, indeed. Um, my next book coming out in the next few months is called Hired Guns, Portraits of Women in Alternative Music, which I've co-written with my best friend, Amanda Kramer. So she's a professional musician. So this is her world we're dealing with. So the, it, the book is about we've picked 10 kind of notable musicians, female musicians who work with major artists. So they're kind of session musicians, touring musicians. So we're kind of detailing their life in the industry. So that's the next book coming out. Um, I'm also working on three new books that I'm under contract for. So these three will be out next year some, some stage. So one of them is, it's the kind of life and career of Roy Wagner, the cinematographer, whom I'm a big fan of and a great admirer and friend of. Um, he has worked prolifically in television. He's shot and designed some of the, oh. the biggest TV shows of the last 30 years. And he's also worked on some amazing films. Um, I'm doing another book with Amanda Den on the development and kind of the movement of film soundtracks in the 60s and kind of going from the, the end of the golden age, the classical compositions and going into the new Hollywood era. So like where you're talking about like pop soundtracks, folk soundtracks, Easy Rider, The Graduate, Midnight Cowboy, and how that developed into a new kind of film music. So going through the 60s, the 70s and the 80s, right up to 1990, you know, so we're kind of looking at 30 years of the evolution of film music. So again, kind of dealing in her world of music. So she brings the music language. I'll bring the film language. It works very well together. So we're working on that at the moment. And then the third film film book I'm working, working on is a book on the Halloween franchise. So kind of like my Elm Street book, you know, kind of going into the making of the teams the ideas of the halloween franchise all of the movies being covered and i'm in the middle of speaking to many directors cinematographers editors composers actors for that so yeah busy times and then i'm also in development on two other projects so one of which is another book with amanda which is kind of a sequel to the hired guns one and then i'm also working on a book about or that could be about um one of my other favorite film stars, which will be a huge, big, um, similar to Burt Reynolds kind of book, I guess. Can you tell us who, or are you? Uh, yeah, well, I've, I've already mentioned it on social media, so Clint Eastwood. Ah, oh, fantastic. Well, that's a, that's a mammoth task, because, I mean, yes, it was. He's, and he's again, still because, churning out, he's still churning out a film a year now, you know. Yeah, and because it, it's like Burt and that, it's a huge career huge cultural and pop cultural impact as well as being this huge film star so there's many aspects to look at it and i've you know i've consulted and there are myriad books out there already over the last mm. 50 years on, on clint so i'm kind of you know I'm, i've found my way in on what i how my approach to it is it's not just again not just making of the movies but more of kind of cultural commentary critique and analysis of various phases of his career various genres he's worked with over the years in particular he's he's quite prolific with westerns and a kind of a film noir aesthetic as well yeah. so but again there's many many areas that I, I will be covering but i'm working on that at the moment developing that for hopefully which will be my next book or one of them anyway so five projects in the works not ten five <laughs> wow okay so quite a lot uh coming out there um uh uh, we we haven't brought David back to say what he's got coming up because he's now retired from the film industry, although he is very active in a number of other areas. But if you want, uh, do check out uh, David's book, Best Seat in the House, which is very very brilliant. I was just about to come in with that, but uh, uh, Wayne uh, jumped in, and in fact, let me get the link for that now, and I will put it in the chat. And um, let me uh, I'll, let me bring David back in quickly because I think he's still with us. Um, the naughty man keeps hiding his camera, but, uh, David, if, uh, uh, if you're still there, do you want to just quickly plug your book, uh, to our listeners and I'm going to get the link for it. The best seat in the house. There we um, go. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> okay. Um, heard, but not seen. Um, <laughs> it's, um, stories I started writing for my kids who are too young to know why I was gone all the time. 
and I wanted them to know what I loved about my work. And it morphed into a book um, with an incredible amount of help, I have to say, from Wayne, who I met through Nick McLean and met in person for the first time a couple of months ago. It's all kind of crazy and wonderful story. But yeah. um, the book is a positive book about the film industry. It's not meant to be telling tales on anybody, but I just happened because of the crazy caram shot of how films are. I met all these amazing people, Milos Forman, Paul Newman, on and on and on and on. And I wanted my kids to know why I liked what I did so much. So that was um, how it came about. So if you want to uh, find out more about David McGiffith's career, not only can you just put his name into IMDb and you'll see he was first AD on all three of the Back to the Future films and most of Sidney Polak's films, but we also have poss possibly the longest interview we've ever done on the channel uh, where we uh, uh, David was uh, more than content to... Uh, stay on with us uh, way beyond the Call of Duty time. And boy, were we glad he did because uh, just had so many fantastic stories um, about so many iconic films um, that he's worked on from everything from Roger Rabbit mm -hmm. um, to Christopher Lloyd going missing at airports and uh, all kinds of other fun stuff. So uh, do check that out. That's on the channel. I think it might be Industry Interview 28 or something like that. The link for David's book is in the chat. The link for Wayne's book uh, is uh, in the blurb underneath. I think I might have it uh, near nearby as well. Yeah, let me, I've got that too. So let's put that in the chat now as well. Um, and those of you that were watching, thank you so much for tuning in. We, we, we had, you know, around 20 people for most of the stream. We've still got 15 people now. If you haven't subscribed to the channel or hit the like button, please do. I have got another stream on Monday night. It's Industry Interview 34. Uh, this is with a new, young, talented uh, British filmmaker who couldn't get money uh, to make his first movie. Um, so he just decided to do it um, himself anyway. Um, and that's happening um, on Monday at 8.30, which is actually preventing me from going to see my a uh, friend do her Amy Winehouse concert, and I completely forgot that it clashed. But I have made a commitment to this uh, filmmaker to doing uh, an interview with him. And in fact, I scheduled it, rescheduled it once already. So I'm not going to change it. Uh, sorry, Jojo, um, that I'm not going to be able to see your gig. Uh, but that is uh, with um, Daniel Glenn Barbour, uh, independent film director. He's He's got his film premiere coming up in August. I just happened to see that on my social media. I caught the trailer. I could tell it was an indie film with a very low budget. And I just said, do you want to come on and talk about your movie? Let's see if we can sell your premiere out for you because they are putting tickets on sale to the public. And that's exactly the sort of um, young creative that I like to support. Um, people that are not being uh, supported by a major institutional funding body or organization, something like that. So we've got him coming on. Monday night, I'll be doing another Lone Wolf stream within a week. Uh, and then, as I said, we're doing a Judge Dredd movie comparison between Sylvester Stallone's and the more recent effort. And then there we No comparison. No comparison. Well, exactly. I mean, well, there will be a comparison, but it, <laughs> yeah, they are poles apart. I would I would agree with you. Um, I was on the set of Stallone's one, and I'll, I'll talk all about that um, in the stream. Lots to say about both of those films and the shenan shenanigans that, that went on. So we'll <clears> talk about that. And then, of course, we got the Michael Mann um, stream coming up. So quite a few things planned for August. Uh, provisionally, the Debbie Evans interview, um, which I have David McGifford to thank for that one, um, is going to happen, I think, on August the 15th. Uh, because... Um, Debbie saw the David McGifford interview and uh, uh, I, when I approached her, I said, I do these interviews. I'd really love to talk to you. You were mentioned in this stream. And, um, uh, and, and I said, I've just done an interview with David McGifford. And as soon as I said that in the chat, she just said, David McGifford, send me the link for the interview. And then she came back literally an hour later and said, I would love to do an interview with you. When would you when would you like to do it? So um, she has 400 credits 
on IMDb as a stunt woman, has been working in the industry since the 70s and um, has done all the Fast and Furious movies except for, I think, one. And her first job, or one of her first jobs, was doubling Linda Carter on the 1970s Wonder Woman series. So that's how long Debbie Evans has been in the yeah long time so she's got a lot of lot of credits more than i'm going to get in my lifetime i can tell you that now so um guys lots of important guests and fun guests coming up i'm sure i'm going to have wayne back on uh, again to d- discuss another top five of well, well we'll probably do a clint eastwood one i think definitely do a clint eastwood one for when your books come out. yeah that, that's, that's going to be just just as hard as it is to do birth. that's going to be harder than this because and we're going to have to say, are we are we including just the ones he's in or are we also including the ones he's directed that he's not in? I mean, I, I think we have to keep it to the ones he's in. But um, even then, he's still done, you know, great performances in films in the last 10 years. So y- yeah. it's not like you're just looking at the, the high point of his career in the 70s and 80s. Um, yeah, that's 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 a tough one. Unforgiven, I think, would be in my top five for sure. That's probably the only film I can definitively say would definitely be in the top five off the top of my head right now. Uh, but yeah, we'll definitely do a, a Clint Eastwood one uh, for sure. I'd love for you to come back and talk about the uh, the Women in Music book in a bit more detail when you w- w- when it's out. And uh, that would be a good stream, I think. that That's quite a, a different uh, topic, but sounds like one that would, would be fun to talk about. Yeah, and- something different for me. I mean, I've... I've- been a music journalist for a few years but to write a whole book about it is um definitely stepping out of my comfort zone but luckily i had amanda there to to do it with me and that's her world so it just worked perfectly Peter and Peter oh. uh, well on that strange ringtone that's probably a good time for us to head out all right so look it remains for me to thank my um guest co-host once again uh, wonderful wayne Byrne. once again um the man hidden behind the black david mcgifford uh, first AD um, and uh, second unit director and many other jobs. Um, great to have you back on, both of you. You're welcome on the channel anytime. Uh, anytime you see one of our streams advertised in advance, if it's not something I've said, hey, do you want to come on and you, you think, oh, I'd like to be on that one and talk about that stuff, just let me know. And, um, you know, if there's if there's room, I'm sure there will be room, um, then you guys can come on and that, that'd be absolutely fine. Everyone in chat, thanks again for supporting us, supporting the channel. Keep keep looking at the things on the channel because I, I, I've got to close those watch hours. I need to get like 80 watch hours. So look at the other interviews, look at the feature film, uh, the journey that's two hours long. If you do like it, please put a review of it on IMDb. And uh, yeah, thanks to um, many of the regulars that were in here, several names that I recognize and a couple of new ones as well. Vex, great to have you come in. Uh, We will see you all again real soon. Don't forget to tell the people that you care about that you love them because you know what? They like to hear that occasionally. Bye. And we are off air.